Well, good afternoon, one and all. And welcome to this very first peer-to-peer -peer learning meeting of the Global Learning Collaborative for Health System Resilience, GLC for HSR, as we fondly call it. My name is Uma Aisola, and I'm the Director of Communications, Relations, and Partnerships at Access Health International. While many of you already know about the GLC for HSR, and are even formally associated with the collaborative. There are many here who aren't very familiar with the initiative so far. So just a brief. GLC for HSR is the platform that brings together a network of health systems experts, practitioners, policy makers, amongst others, and a, with a vision to facilitate cross learnings between them towards building a better and more resilient health systems, especially in the wake of the pandemic and the other public health crisis that we have seen over the last two years. The platform will facilitate practical and reciprocal knowledge sharing and co-creation of effective health system resilience strategies. GLC for HSR members, will contribute to the knowledge base and the best practices to strengthen the health system resilience while benefiting from cross-border learnings and collaborative opportunities. We have a rather diverse group of cross country audience with us today from public health, health systems researchers, practitioners to develop sectors, partners and government functionaries. On behalf of the Rockefeller Foundation, who supported the initiation of this uh, collaborative and the Access Health International, we welcome you all to hope that the next few hours are going to present a rich and insightful discussion on how health systems across countries can be better prepared for disasters and shocks. Today's meeting is in continuation with a series of learning meetings that the Global Learning Collaborative has been holding for the past few months. In line with the learning structure of the GLC for HSR, we hold quarterly meetings, annual meetings, and interim meetings in the form of roundtable discussions, learning meetings amongst experts and practitioners, one of them which we will start today. These meetings are centered around very specific themes, and you are aware today's meeting will focus on three very important areas of health systems resilience. We are graced and honored to have panel, who I'm sure will help us with enough thought and enough insights for us to take forwards. For any assistance, please send a private message to the host and we will get back to you right away. So I would now hand it over to Dr. Anuradha Katyal, the technical lead and head of research and data analytics at Access Health International to begin the proceedings of the first session on health systems assessment framework. Anuradha. Thank uh Thank you so much, Dr. Uma Isola, for uh, the introduction to the collaborative and what we intend to do over the journey of, of uh, the next uh, years to come. I think uh, I'll start by saying that as a researcher, one of the key areas of uh, the Global Learning Collaborative is to uh, one, create, or rather I would say co-create and then disseminate knowledge. And in doing that, as Uma rightly mentioned, encourage reciprocal learning. Uh, now, currently, we are focusing on Asia Pacific. However, our vision is global. And henceforth, this discussion would be global. And uh, we intend to ensure that the learnings we call this journey a learning journey are well documented and disseminated among all of you. So uh, without much further ado, uh, I'll just introduce you to why uh, this particular study was done. Uh, the Global Learning Collaborative has certain focus areas like surveillance, 
uh, we have pandemic preparedness as a focus area, we have rapid response as a focus area. However, the conduit between all of these is health, all of these different areas of focus is health systems resilience. Uh, and health systems resilience has been emerging or rather re-emerging over the past few years. If you look at this slide, there are two key areas in this slide. Uh, the first is recognizing the need that health systems resilience is a very uh, global yet a very localized aspect. Uh, there is a need of a dedicated health workforce in the wake of a disaster. And these are predominantly the learnings from the Haiti disaster, if I were to put it in this way. The second is with the emergence and re-emergence of different infectious diseases like Ebola and more recently COVID-19. Uh, there is a call for more global collaboration, a call for strengthening areas of scientific inquiry like genomic surveillance, and also the need for digital transformation of healthcare. So given that scenario, we thought that let's start this learning journey uh, with health systems resilience and understanding of how health systems resilience is being measured, what are the counters of health systems resilience, and in doing so, what are the different frameworks which exist currently. So we started uh, this journey by conducting a gap analysis. Apologize for using the word journey so many times because the Global Learning Col Collaborative refers each uh, paper as a learning journey. Uh, we conducted a gap analysis of the existing frameworks. Uh, so we developed this four by six matrix uh, which had the four areas of the health systems uh, shock cycle or a disaster cycle, which is prepare, respond, recover, and mitigate. And on the other side, we had the six building blocks of WHO. And we try to understand that what are the gaps and what are the opportunities across these different frameworks, which I have tried to um, enumerate here. And uh, after we did the scoping review, we started speaking to some people who have very actively worked on this uh, on this particular aspect, they've tried to measure uh, resilience across different countries. And also the practitioners, uh, as Uma was mentioning, we have a plethora of people who have been very kindly working with us throughout this cycle uh, to understand how the different resilience frameworks are actually adopted in the countries. And today we culminate this particular paper in a P2P learning session uh, to understand uh, from the different global experts uh, what exactly is the counter of health system resilience and how this can be measured better to ensure that there is global collaboration. Now, a resilient health system, uh, these are the WHO building blocks, uh, all of you are aware of that. A resilient health system is not just about health workforce or service delivery or a clear information channel which exists for risk communication or good medical supplies and more importantly, health financing and governance and leadership. But it also has various other elements which we found in these frameworks, like uh, I have highlighted genetic surveillance and other elements like public information and warning systems. A lot of experts spoke about the fact that vulnerability reduction needs to be very importantly looked at. Uh, the relevance of saving lives, especially when you are in the phase of responding to the pandemic, and finally, the operational coordination that is needed, not just between the different ministries, but also between public, private, between innovators. We looked at culture as an element which, uh, which leads to a variation in the response. And finally, more importantly, scientific studies, development of vaccines, how these processes can be expedited. When we started the expert uh, discussions, uh, we actually had two elements in our uh, mind. One was what is to be measured, what is to be prioritized. And in addition to that, how, does, uh, how do these elements need to be measured? Uh, so this was a broad discussion um, we had with the experts. We conducted a thematic analysis of these uh, expert discussions. And we came up with these emerging themes. Like the first is most of the experts talked about resilience both in the wake of, uh, say, a disaster, as well as during peacetime. So what you do essentially during the peacetime will enable your response during a disaster. Uh, the measures of resilience were discussed at length, 
uh, there were experts who spoke about the fact that there is a dire need for leadership and governance. But leadership and governance in isolation cannot do anything if you do not have a good workforce. So uh, we had very varied answers, but these were the two key elements which most of the experts spoke about. <coughs> Finally, how do you prioritize or what has to be the adoption journey of resilience? Uh, uh, systems are, uh, uh, so as to say, mixed in nature. So the need to engage private sector and that to be backed by a good regulatory framework was also discussed. Uh, we also discussed about learnings from various health systems. And it was, dis it was mentioned that most of the Asian countries who have been more prone to outbreaks and disasters have shown more resilience because they had these learnings and they rapidly recycled their systems in that process. We also discussed about the economies of health. Now, health is not cannot be viewed in isolation. And even WHO says that in its definition. Uh, the speaker spoke about livelihoods, the need to engage the communities, kind of adding on to the element of culture, which I just discussed and also other social determinants, which are often overlooked, especially in the uh, low and middle income countries was something which was discussed and will be a part of the paper. Now, speaking about this panel discussions, there is a, a fourfold uh, objective of this particular discussion. One is to enable cross learning from both academia and practitioners. Uh, both of them need to go hand in hand to ensure that the health system is resilient, responds well, and the health system's resilience can be measured, so as to say. The second is to strengthen the learnings. We have a lot of contextual learning since we spoke to people across regions. How do you strengthen your uh, own local aspect while you're thinking globally is something we intend to uh, derive from this panel discussion. To be more prepared for the future, uh, to sort of have this adoption journey and how countries need to focus on various aspects as they move towards health systems resilience. And obviously, uh, the need to reciprocally learn, to collaborate, and obviously the party stakeholders coming together and ensuring that this journey is more seamless. Uh, without much further ado, uh, these are our co-authors. Uh, Dr. Malik, uh, Mr. Malik Chokshi is our technical lead of Global Learning Collaborative for Health Systems Resilience, and he is going to be moderating this session. I would like to introduce Malik Chokshi. Uh, Mr. Malik Chokshi is a respected public health researcher in India. He is our deputy country director, <clears throat> technical. Uh, he is a passionate academician. I have learned a lot uh, from him on areas like health financing. Uh, supply chains in healthcare. He has worked on most of the Indian uh, uh, Indian research pieces, like the the high level expert group of uh, planning commission. He was a part of the uh, Niti Aayog's vision for a better India, especially healthcare. He was a part of Government of India's recent economic survey. I could perhaps go on and on, but to sum up, Malik has worked with some of the most eminent development partners and is going to moderate this session for us. Thank you, over to you, Malik. Uh, thank you very much <coughs> for the kind introduction. Uh, and please do take care of uh, Anura just coming out of COVID. So thanks for uh, the presentation, it has been very helpful. So my my role today as a moderator is, as Anura said that we did some uh, uh, work on understanding health system resilience and, and its contours. Uh, but the best, and in the process, we have interacted with a, a lot of colleagues in the process. But the best uh, way of learning is to kind of have interaction among experts. And for me, it's a pleasure to invite our four panelists today. Uh, and I'll try to give a brief introduction before uh, starting this conversation. Uh, Dr. Irene uh, Papa Nicholas, uh, uh, she is an associate professor of health economics and Department of Health Policy at London School of Economics and Policy Science, uh, uh, my alma mater, and and she her focus, uh, a teaching focus is on performance assessment of health systems, and she examines uh, uh, existing approaches to measure and incentivize performance of health services. She's also a visiting fellow at a Harvard uh, Teach and School of Public Health uh, and was a Harkness uh, fellow in 2015-16 and an associate editor of General of Health Policy. 
But the most important thing in the context of today's panel discussion is that she is one of the lead author of a recent WHO uh, paper on framework analysis, which measures health system resilience and a proposed uh, 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 a contours on what a framework should look like. So uh, Dr. Irene, uh, thank you for giving us time and it's a pleasure to welcome you. Uh, along with uh, Dr. Irene, uh, we are joined by uh, uh, Ms. Reda Sifelden. Uh, she's a technical officer uh, at the World Health Organization in Geneva. And her work focuses uh, on supporting countries to build uh, health system resilience to public health challenges. And, and she plays a central role in developing a set of health system resilience indicators uh, and a global measurement indicators, a, a toolkit which is kind of again recently published by, by Reda. And it will be fantastic to hear from, from Reda about the indicators and the approaches uh, to measure health system resilience. Uh, we have a, a professor uh, uh, who's Zhang, who is a health economist and a physician and associate professor of Department of International Health School of Nursing and Health Studies at Georgetown University. Uh, his research focuses on disease board on healthcare system, health financing, and cost effectiveness analysis. He has uh, done a lot of work on evaluation of policies and programs and work with uh, World Bank, USAID, UN, uh, Gates Foundation. And he has got an uh, MD from uh, uh, Fudan University, uh, uh, China. Uh, uh, Dr. Zeng, uh, a pleasure to welcome you. And uh, we have uh, the last panelist that we have on the panel is Dr. Anish. Uh, he's an associate professor. Uh, 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 he's an epidemiologist, teacher, and researcher uh, uh, from uh, uh, government uh, college, a medical college in, in Kerala. Uh, he was one of the focal point of COVID mitigation response in the state of Kerala. And the state of Kerala, uh, um, the reason I'm mentioning here because it's one of the state in India which has got uh, faced various kind of shocks, uh, whether it's Nipah, Zika, uh, 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 natural uh, uh, disaster, and, and now COVID. And, and he has been uh, uh, recently convener of the expert committee on COVID response. And he is part of, of the disaster management authority to build a resilient health system. And, and, and these are the expert panels and panelists. Thank you very much for agreeing uh, to be part, uh, part of this dialogue. So if I may start with uh, uh, Professor uh, Irene. Professor, your work has looked at various frameworks, right? But according to uh, your, your understanding, different frameworks look uh, at the definition of resilience differently. So according to you, how would you define health system resilience? And is a health system resilience an inherent quality or it's an outcome of a system? So if you can start the discourse, and I would be jumping across maybe various panels depending. But uh, Professor Irene, if you can have a response from you on the whole construct of health system resilience itself. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, um, Malik, for that introduction and for, for highlighting the, the work of the book. Um, and at the, in the book specifically, we didn't look at health systems resilience per se, but rather thought about health systems performance assessment and really how can, how can we think about, you know, traditionally how that's been looked at within countries and by international organizations. And so um, we looked at uh, the different outcomes of the health system that are often assessed. So things like health improvement, um, people centeredness, equity, efficiency, um, some of the intermediate goals that we look at, which are instrumental to achieving these like access and quality. And also, you know, the functions that make up the health system. So things like financing, research generation, governance, um, and uh, service delivery. And when we thought about resilience, and this became, you know, really crucial, I think, when we were doing the work because of the pandemic and really think about how does resilience fit into the framework, the way that we conceptualized it um, was that resilience, the way that we would think of resilience in the framework is your ability to continue to maintain kind of the goals that you're seeking, the high levels of health system performance, which could be defined as, you know, the attainment of, of certain outputs. So your ability to continue to maintain these in the face of a shock. And so the way that we would use the framework to measure resilience would be to look at the attainment of these goals and to understand if and how they're affected by a shock, such as a pandemic or an economic crisis, uh, and really use the framework to understand which parts of the health system 
the, the shock will influence. So is it that, you know, that the pandemic has a big shock on uh, uh, the workforce and service delivery and through that, you know, affects the intermediate and final goals. And then you can use the framework also to try to think about the correct response to be able to maintain performance at current levels. But really the way we thought about resilience is able to maintain a certain level of performance or even improve that performance in the face of, uh, of a shock. So, so I mean, if, if, I may, if I may extend the discourse, right? Obviously, the framework works within a boundaries, right? And, 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 and within, by defining those boundaries, are there certain crucial elements you think that it depends or it varies depending upon the type of shock or, or does the framework emphasis on, or most of the framework emphasis on one input more versus under representation of an other input? So what we tried to do is, again, because this was a framework of health system performance assessment, we wanted to be flexible in terms of the shocks that it could incorporate. And so the way, again, that we would suggest using the framework to think about resilience is there are many different shocks, right? If we take recent shocks, we have the COVID pandemic, we can think of financial crisis. These are going to affect well, health systems differently and potentially affect different health systems in different parts of the world differently. And so... Again, I mean, the way we thought about resilience is if you're doing this comparatively you know, in the face of a shock, do you see that certain systems are able to maintain their outcomes or even improve their outcomes in that period more than others? And those are the ones that we would call potentially more resilient, but also in terms of understanding the actions and the shock itself, where does the, sh the shock impact the system? And so our framework kind of details uh, a bunch of performance assessment areas to think about to measure the different functions or the performance of the functions of the system. So how well your financing function is operating, how well your service delivery function is operating, how well governance is operating. And so we would look at the resilience, the, the shock in the different systems and try to understand where it's impacting the system to be able then to think of an actionable way to address, uh, I guess, that shock. I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, that's very helpful, but just a, a bit of clarification on that. Most of the indicators are, are very macro level. And when we were talking to uh, uh, kind of practitioners, right? And I, I, th I think so, the, they feel that on, on actionable or the output that you measured earlier, I think so, their connection establishment needs to be stronger. Would you agree to that statement or would you say that the framework captures those uh, uh, intermediate uh, 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 goals or, or output comprehensively? So what the framework tries to do, which I think is the, the addition to the space, is to not only think of how we measure the, the goals of the system, right, which are maybe the macro level goals that you're talking about. So not just, you know, uh, health, population health measures, for example, which are quite macro, uh, but also tries to think about what are the intermediate objectives that we we use to measure progress to these macro goals, but also how do we measure the performance of the functions themselves? And this is what's, so if you have, uh, if you believe that a strong health system, you know, will lead to, to good health system outcomes, which we do, then we believe it is important to be measuring the performance of the functions themselves at any one point in time. So if you take financing, you, you know, you can think about how equitable are the contributions, um, how, you know, uh, resilient are your contributions to a shock, to an aging population, and those indicators we have suggested in the framework. So that's where the innovation is, not only thinking about, you know, ultimately, how are your outcomes performing in the face of the shock, but if you think about where the shock is occurring, can you see changes in the performance of the functions or, you know, the parts of the health system and, and how they operate that might influence the final outcomes, right? So do you see that the shock influences the numbers of doctors that you have and the ability, you know, then to provide um, patient-centered care or certain, meet certain processes of care, which are intermediate goals, and then that, how does that translate into your final goals? So, so the framework is very detailed, and I don't know how many people have seen the framework or the book, but it's, it's, it's quite big because it tries to outline these different uh, assessment areas and indicators for all parts of the health system, not just the final outcomes, but also the functions themselves, so that you're able to, to assess how they're performing, because we believe that the performance of the functions will be instrumental then in, in terms of the performance of the intermediate goals and the final goals of the health system. Professor, you also did mention about, in, in your previous uh, uh, statement of, of the applicability of framework under different circumstances, right? Uh, a, a different type of shock, if I may say, right? 
but would you say that if let's say uh, a disaster versus uh, a shock like in, in a kind of war uh, right versus a, a, a shock in, in natural calamity versus pandemic right there would mm -hmm. be certain elements which are going to be constant and certain which are variable so which are which are those constant uh, uh, kind of uh, variable uh, constant elements do you think are, are important for system resilience so now financing uh, human resources uh, do what without this i think so uh, it's it's not possible for systems to bounce back well we use the 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 functions of the framework defined kind of in the 2000 WHO framework so we, we i guess with the modification that we we uh, conceptualized governance instead of stu stewardship um but we we looked at governance financing service delivery and resource generation is the four key functions um of course we also placed the health system within a broader context right to think about the broader political socio and economic landscape because that you know changes in that environment can create shocks on the system so uh, but we in terms of the the performance and the functions that support the system themselves we thought about the the four functions and we really focused the framework on how we would measure the performance of those four functions within a health system in this, in this context i think so one of, one of if you look at the covid right community had a very very strong role in responding or or, or defining the resilience of, of a health system and at most in most of the framework that we also saw there was an underrepresentation of community participation so how do you respond uh, 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 to that that the role of community players into health system resilience so i think uh, there's a number of areas in the framework that that might show up uh, one would be I think in within the um, the system and the governance uh, part. So how how is the system engaging with the community? You know, and 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 indicators around that engagement and how sustainable that is. But also, you could think of that as as outside the health system and kind of a broader, I guess, maybe a social factor. And 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 um, and really, I think what we would look at in terms of the framework is the actions within the system to engage with the community and how you can strengthen those or how strong they are. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ari. I think so we'll come back to you. Uh, let me ask Reda about uh, the, the, the alignment, you know, the work that you did on the framework and, and the alignment of the framework with, with the indicators that have been recently kind of published by, by uh, WHO again. So uh, whether you heard what Professor Irene said, uh, would you think that uh, there is there is an alignment on, on on the framework and the indicators that have been kind of uh, drawn uh, 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 by uh, WHO recently? Okay, so um, thank you very much, uh, Malik. Thank you so much for the invitation to this important learning session, and congratulations on the work that you're doing on health system resilience assessment. Now, I think one important lesson um, from the COVID-19 pandemic and other public health events is that health system resilience building needs to be intentionally designed and uh, with targeted and well integrated inputs and measurements to ensure that the desired attributes of resilience are developed and sustained. It is not something that just happens from um, any inputs in the health system, that intentional and well-targeted um, um, approach is very important. Now, well-defined indicators and measurement mechanisms are indeed needed to identify the strengths, the gaps, and inform resilience building efforts, whether it's at policy, planning, or operational levels of the health systems in countries. Now, the work that we're looking at today um, in relation to your question is indeed timely and can contribute to informing a more integrated health systems um, resilience assessment in countries. Now, the collation of key indicators in, in the work can indeed complement other efforts in strengthening and monitoring uh, and evaluating health systems resilience across the different building blocks of the health system. But I, th I think, as you have also already mentioned, that there are some areas that have, have been underrepresented, like the community um, participation, whole of society, whole of government approaches, and multi-sectoral um, responsibilities. 
Now, besides this, I would also like to, to highlight a few areas for consideration that can help in really aligning um, the work that we're doing on health, on health system resilience assessments. For example, in, in, in the area of cell service delivery, it is essential to prioritize population-based health services or public health services along with clinical care. I think the disproportionate um, prioritization of clinical care over population based uh, focused um, services has been one of the challenges in making health systems more resilient. Now, in terms of alignment with health systems resilience framework, I think to make the indicators more fit for purpose, it is important to consider linking each indicator to capacities or attributes of resilient health systems including those capacities and attributes that are related to the ability to predict and mitigate public health risks and the capacity to maintain essential health services, both individual and population-based health services, while responding to public health emergencies. And of course, the capacity to be able to learn and, uh, and improve and transform based on the experience um, from various public health challenges and events. I think those are, would be really important. And then the scope of the indicators, I think it's also very important to consider giving more attention to indicators that are associated with everyday resilience to public health challenges, to the day-to-day -day routine public health challenges. The health system resilience is not only relevant to preparedness and response in the context of acute and uh, the large scale public health emergencies, but also about how health systems can manage routine population health needs and, uh, and challenges and address the day to day stresses that they're faced with. Now, we know that without resilience to these everyday stressors, it is unlikely that health systems would be resilient you know, in times of emergencies, which is the time that resilience seems to get the more at most attention. But it would be key that the same amount of attention is given to building resilience, but as in monitoring and evaluation and other aspects, um, even in the routine day-to-day -day functioning of the health system. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, sir. You, you, you kind of uh, raised kind of two or three kind of important kind of uh, nuances in this. One, when you say that we need to build this resilience, right? Whose responsibility is it? Is it? You know, uh, obviously, in COVID, in different countries, uh, different uh, departments have responded. Somewhere, even European countries, even military uh, was or kind of armed forces was was brought into. So. Whose responsibility is to kind of prioritize this? And when you say it, uh, public health versus clinical, I think so where does the decision making space exist right now? So the question is who is responsible? Yeah. Who is responsible? <laughs> yes. Okay, that's, I think that's a, an important question. Because one thing that we emphasize is really the accountability, having clearly defined roles of the stakeholders and accountability for resilience. I think, as I mentioned earlier, it's, I think that we have learned and need to really apply the lesson that resilience would not just happen by chance. There needs to be clearly defined um, responsibilities and accountability mechanisms across the different stakeholders. Now, in terms of who is responsible, I would say everyone, everyone has a role to play within the health sector and allied sectors. And the whole of government, whole of society um, approach has really become very, you know, um, pronounced in, in during the COVID-19 pandemic. And even during other um, public health events, that the responsibility for resilience does not solely lie on the health sector, because the threats, the public health challenges to which health systems need to be resilient, are not 
um, depend on a number of other factors. They are very multifaceted. You know, looking at climate change, for example, and the and the related health impacts on the health system, and how and and, and the populations. Looking at um, uh, different environmental um, factors and uh, aging populations, demographics. There are many factors that contribute to the public health stresses that health systems need to respond to. So that multi-sectoral approach would be very critical. So whether it's at, uh, and one, one area, I think one gap that we've also noticed is that um, the role of the sub-national and uh, primary care level services is usually under um, represented or underestimated. But when it comes, if we act, when if we actually want to build resilience in our health systems, it is important that these very the lowest level from the community health volunteers, from the primary services, and across the th the various levels of service delivery to the health authorities, whether those in the animal sector, those in the in the private sectors, also need to be well engaged in the process of building health systems resilience at policy levels, in planning, and also uh, at the operational levels. And of course, in monitoring and evaluating um, the processes and the inputs and the expected outcomes um, in building resilience. So I would say everyone has a role in a nutshell. But I, private, public, I, th I think the, the role of private um, sector is also very key and often overlooked. So I would like to also emphasize that aspect as well. Thank you very much. Uh, just one last question. Yeah. In the report, uh, you have mentioned about public health system resilience scorecard, right? Yes. Right? So, you know, different countries are on a different uh, progressivity, I would say different level of health system. You know, how can this countries kind of create those kind of uh, 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 scorecard. Uh, does the scorecard give that, that flexibility for system to adapt itself in, in, in scoring themselves? Yes, yes in, the, in the health system resilience toolkit, I believe that's the, the product that you're, that you're referring to, yes, that we recently published um, from our team. Uh, yes. Um, the public health system resilience scorecard is one of the key resources in that toolkit. And the reason we have it there is because it complements other assessment tools by drawing dedicated attention to public health. I think we know and all agree that a resilient health system must have a strong public health orientation so that health systems would be able to maintain the essential functions while managing public health events and other challenges as well as adapt itself to respond to the diverse routine um, challenges. And that is why in the position paper, I think not only in, in, in the talk in the position paper on building health systems resilience um, during the COVID-19 um, pandemic and beyond, um, as WHO's position paper on this, um, the emphasis, there is emphasis on the role of essential public health functions and a primary care, which includes essential public health functions as part of its core functions in policy, in, in the policy recommendations um, to countries and partners um, from that position paper, which we're hoping would inform uh, countries' recovery in the context of COVID-19 and beyond. So just to give a background on why we have um, that um, tool in the toolkit. Now, in terms of application, so we know that there is no one size fits all solution to building health systems resilience with uh, strong public health foundations you know, at, at all levels. So, but adapting and applying the essential public health functions does provide a holistic and uh, integrated framing that is very much needed for effective and efficient health systems uh, assessments and follow-up actions. So this is particularly important as public health uh, is 
often given low priority in health system uh, planning and policies, especially compared to clinical care. I think we see more attention on the individualized and, and clinical care, whereas um, public health foundations, uh, public health orientations would be key for resilience. And for example, in the Euro European Union, um, sorry, region, I think not only in low um, income settings, even in the European region, it was found that only around 3% of the national health budget was found to be dedicated to public health, which is something that you know, calls for attention. And in order, so in, in order to support countries to integrate this kind of public health consideration in strengthening their health systems, I think, and applying tools like, like that one in, in not as a silo, but in um, alignment with other measurement efforts in countries that contribute to resilience. I think there are key enablers that are needed, such as adequate and, and, and well-defined public health stewardship, strong public health stewardship, I would say, and multi-sectoral collaboration. And as I mentioned earlier, accountability mechanisms. I think all of these need to be informed by comprehensive population health needs so that the application of these tools are uh, addressing the needs of the population. And then in our ongoing um, work related to supporting countries in measuring and evaluating their health systems resilience, I think we also emphasize this kind of um, public health approach for example, the draft resilience indicators package that we developed, which is being adapted in countries, provides a focus on both individual based and population based health services as a manifestation of a functional and resilient health system. Now, also, we say in the recently published uh, primary um, healthcare measurement framework of WHO, there is an indicator on the essential public health functions. I think it's about institutionalizing, um, having that institutionalized um, capacity to meet essential public health functions and operations, along with um, other health resilience resi related indicators in that framework. So yes, the public health um, scorecard that you have mentioned is, is important and to give that kind of public health orientation, what we are really emphasizing um, integration alignment between the various entry points, you know, uh, measurement approaches in countries and proper interoperability so that the data that is needed to inform resilience is readily available within and outside emergency context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veda. Uh, 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 I think this has been very helpful. I'll come back to you uh, 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 in the due course. But let me let me ask uh, uh, Professor Zhang in this context that uh, there are various frameworks and indicators of health system resilience which are constructed globally, right? But when it comes to a country's uh, application, you know. Uh, do you think that it's easier for countries to adopt them, or do you think that each and every country needs to look at differently? Well, thanks for inviting me uh, for this uh, important meeting. And so, just to answer your question, I think um, I think um, the uh, applying these indicators to the countries, I think we definitely need to contextualize the countries' uh, context. And because uh, country will have their own strengths and, and limitations, and just take the workforce as example, some countries may have a lot of um, uh, like uh, doctors and nurses, but uh, if you look at some other countries like developing countries, workforce might be a, a major issue, right? And but but may not be as, uh, the issue for for others. I think we really need to have the countries understand what their limitations are, what they need to uh, uh, strengthen. I think the framework would 
be quite important to provide uh, what dimensions they need to look uh, look into. Uh, I just want to uh, also mention a few things. Actually, some of the uh, has been men men mentioned in terms of the indicators and and dimensions to look, look into. I think you have. The, the report have uh, looked at WHO's uh, building blocks, and uh, I very much agree with um, Mr. Reader's uh, comments. When it come to the pandemic or emergencies, generally we take the whole of the society approach or whole of the government approach to address it. I think we need to go beyond to the medical system, I think, and also incorporate some of the other elements uh, as well. Uh, for example, we may need, need to also emphasize more on public, public health functions, the detection, surveillance, uh, those issues. And I think you also mentioned about the, the importance of the communities in the uh, either disease control or the disaster, uh, disaster relief uh, act, in, uh, activities. I think, uh, for example, in, in during this COVID-19, we see a lot of uh, frontiers working on different areas. That, that those are quite important in terms of building a country's resilience to recover from the, uh, these uh, shocks. And I th there is, uh, of course, there is uh, another high level of the multisectoral um, uh, uh, collaborations, right? Basically, we need to have these uh, multiple levels of the um, measurement, community level, public health level, med medical services level, and also multisectoral uh, level. And, Another thing I want to just base on my uh, uh, reading about uh, uh, the China's uh, or some countries' response uh, to the pandemic, or what they have done right, or what have done wrong. I just want to emphasize uh, the governance and leadership. Uh, I know there are many other <laughs> aspects we need to look, we all look, need to look into, but if we compare some of the countries, um, of course, as I mentioned before, we need to look into one and we'll need to strengthen, but I think a lot of has to do with the uh, governance issues, leadership issues, accountability issues even the trust issues, how much we trust the health system we have in order to um, uh, do some of the medical activities, public health activities. So first side, and the leadership is quite important. And, and when I think about China's uh, uh, response at the beginning of the COVID-19, the top leadership actually, uh, from president to uh, to the uh, uh, like a county leadership, they all have a clear understanding what's what's going on out there, and they have an uh, urgent meetings uh, with uh, top leaderships at different levels, and the information actually streamed down to the bottom of the system. And the second, I think, uh, uh, Ms. Rudder also mentioned accountability. Uh, we, we really need to know who is responsible on what. At the same time, um, if something happened, uh, who, is re uh, who is responsible to? I think it, um, no matter is the COVID-19 uh, uh, response or the previous uh, response on uh, SARS in 2003 in China, we hold the top, lead, um, the top leadership at the different levels uh, accountable. If you are not good, uh, doing well and they may be removed from post and basically the, the response to COVID-19 or the diseases becomes a test of the capacity of the uh, leaderships. And there are also some uh, elements uh, 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 I mentioned already, trust. We really need to, need to know whether 
the trust, uh, the population trust, the government does not, and how can we build the trust uh, between the government and and the populations? And so you can see uh, the, the some countries are doing poorly. Basically, uh, lack of the trust of the government at interventions is um, one of the major reason. Um, I think I will stop here. Thank you. Professor Zhang, I think so. You have, you have you have reached out very, very important function. But again, what you said, what Reda said, and what I, uh, Professor Irene said, I think so. We are talking in, in kind of health system context at a country level, right? But now also, pandemic has showed, and, and I think so in, in early 20, uh, uh, 20th century, HIV has showed us, right? that now most of the things our health system are also affected uh, by what happens globally, right? And even if I look at health system indicator, let's say consumables, right? Or in certain countries financing, the way a global community behaves, let's say donor community behavior will affect financing, uh, the way uh, we have access to uh, uh, COVID vaccines and, and diagnostics, it has a lot of kind of, uh, uh, international uh, impression on that. So in that context, uh, in, at, a, at a country level, a certain kind of which would the element which country can control and which country cannot control. Because if I say access to now vaccines in current, lot many country, there are very few countries who have got production capacity. And that was one of the point that uh, one of the practitioners said. Uh, and a lot of the, lot of the consumable supplies are, are driven by, uh, by global community. So when this whole country's uh, bridge or the globalization is breaking down country specific bridges, would you think that the tension will emerge or kind of it will become more difficult to address or kind of create resilient system? Even in human resources, by migration of human resources again is a is a point. Certainly, I uh, advocate for more collaborations rather than having this uh, siloed approach. Each country deal with their own, but but I uh, I think it's uh, with uh, all these migrations and all the travel issues, uh, we do need to take the uh, global as a as a whole, right? That's why there is uh, we need to have a WHO as the main coordinator of the. COVID-19 re response to coordinate the resources allocation to uh, have a World Bank and other donor uh, communities to play a role in financing, in building a capacity in terms of coordination of the uh, uh, responses as well as the procurement of the um, um, medical supplies, all the PPEs, all the vaccines. Like you said, I, th I think that we do need to strengthen the global uh, community to better coordinate uh, different countries, the different sectors. And previously, I think, uh, uh, Ms. Radar and also Dr. Irena also mentioned about a public uh, private sector collaborations um, in terms of the financing uh, the, the services as well as the producing of the uh, some equ equipment. I think a siloed approach is not going to work when we face the, the common um, enemies like virus or bacteria. Uh, Tears and we do need to have this kind of a, uh, uh, meetings to share our knowledge, to uh, learn from each other. Uh, I, I think a few months ago, I was uh, evaluating uh, uh, European CDC as uh, collaboration with other uh, uh, CDCs. They when we, I conduct interview to the, uh, to the, some of the people, they're just saying that. The, just by sharing our knowledge, learning what other people do, and it is a big help from the countries who lack of such knowledge, who have no experience uh, doing uh, the disease control or having uh, difficulties uh, to adjust the issues. Uh, I think that the sharing knowledge and sometimes uh, just uh, providing the technical assistance from one country to other countries, I think that will be definitely beneficial for the uh, uh, pandemic response.
uh, thank you and very helpful i think so uh, we, we should thank uh, global learning collaborative for that i think so the, the, the third session is on leadership and governance and i'm sure that these questions will be teased out uh, much better uh, later on but uh, uh, thanks and again i'll come back to you uh, uh, let me ask uh, uh, professor anish uh, from kerala right Professor Anish, you heard about the frameworks, indicators, uh, and you heard about how countries and global collaborators can work. But you have been helm of affairs for almost, uh, I would say, uh, I, as far as I remember, for almost six to eight years now. So how would you think that it this, this conversation really gets applied at, 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 at a state level or at a community level? And, and, and what what are the best learnings or what are the best way to move forward on this? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. George Key. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So this question is very important. One <laughs> thing is uh, uh, translating these things to the field level is very, very important. Uh, so Kerala has what a nice experience regarding uh, having uh, resilience in health system in the context of COVID-19. Uh, second one is Kerala is one of the places all over the world where I think COVID-19, the pandemic was met maybe decently, fairly nicely. And we have got a lot of experience from our state. So can I have share my slides so that I can explain a few of the, the things that we, we did in Kerala so that it will help you to understand. Uh, I, I hope that my screen is visible. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, this is one analysis we have conducted just before the second wave of COVID-19 that was striking uh, India. At that point of time, Kerala was delivered somewhere around 150 guidelines and advisories regarding the pandemic. So this is very important that our people has to know that what we are going to do. COVID-19 or rather any public health issues are it is not a good way to have a firefight. Rather we have to plan and we have to inform our people that this is the things that we are going to do. So that is a very important aspect of building a resilient system. That is one aspect or one thing that we have to learn from Kerala. These are the different types of guidelines that we have given. And second aspect, we are now we are using uh, the GIS platforms and all other things. This is regarding the uh, containment zones that Kerala in some aspect, some, some time in the COVID-19 pandemic that people have to know that where you are residing is a containment area and you have to focus more on this particular area. Sometimes the movement may be restricted in this particular area. So one thing is if you want to build a sustainable resilient system, we have to take our people into confidence that we have to inform them because they are basically there at the grassroots level are doing what the public health resilience is. That is one major aspect of that. Uh, second one is uh, COVID-19. Uh, it is just, it is not a, people may say that it is just like a marathon. It's not like a sprint. Sometimes Kerala has got different experiences with different diseases. When Nipah is striking Kerala, it was all these things, problems were solved within two months time, maybe within two incubation period of Nipah. But for COVID, Still, we are having problem with COVID. So the planning is very, very important. Now we have got different mathematical modeling of their artificial intelligence is emerging. So we have to use these kinds of sophisticated technologies and we have to map out what are the resources available. This is one exercise that is done by Kerala Disaster Management Authority just before the COVID pandemic that how much institutions are available. If there is a rampant pandemic is emerging in the state, how much beds we can preserve, including that of hotels, sometimes the classrooms, the benches and desks, or chairs that is maybe used in classrooms can be converted into beds. So, so this, is, this kinds of mapping is very important. And 
the building the new system because covid 19 when covid 19 was striking in kerala there was only 125000 beds that is 12500 beds were available in the public health system so for covid alone we have built somewhere around 200 uh, two to two lakhs beds that is something very important that we have to address the pandemic sometimes we have to use the existing system sometimes you have to build system very clearly understanding what is happening to the pandemic the epidemiology of the pandemic is very important nipa sometimes it may be even if it is going to have create a lot of fear in the community it may not emerge as a pandemic so even if the for a people's perspective nipa may be a dreaded disease the killing power of nipa is somewhere around 90 percentage but for covid 19 it is a mild disease the killing power is somewhere around 1 percentage so if you look at nipa that would be stopped within two months time maybe having around 15 or 20 casualties but kerala even in kerala covid 19 is actually a big issue that we have uh, and another thing is we have we were in kerala we were trying to develop new systems when covid 19 was striking there was only one lab in the entire state under the public health system to test pcr that was uh, national institute of virology at uh, anapi but now we have got around 50 labs inside the government system and if you consider the lab that is available in private sector also it is somewhere around 1000 labs so we are actually moving from one lab to 1000 lab because of you know, the the pandemic so this is a very important thing and in pandemic situations we were trying to emerge or move ahead with pandemic and we were trying to build our system that is a very important thing and another aspect of this resiliency social protection because uh, when the pandemic is striking so many priorities of people will be under question people cannot move people cannot go and work shit people cannot go and work so the poverty is going to strike so we, it is very important to give them food you have to identify who are the marginalized segment of the population and we have to take care of them otherwise the problem is one thing is the covid 19 the this but this death rate maybe the the death that may not be account to covid 19 the excess mortality may be increased because of poverty and other things that is one thing and second one is these people may not comply to your instructions so the protection of people very important and just have you have to maybe account their religious sentiments and all other things that may have some kind of uh, and it may it may increase the disease burdens but we have to have a maybe a a, a, a trade off between the disease increase because of this kind of social interaction and the strict kind of uh, mitigation strategies and another very important aspect that in kerala covid 19 was used as a context of uh, implementing universal health coverage in kerala around 60 percentage of people are going for private sector for uh, their uh, clinical services and most of them are very paid as compared to uh, just like any other part of india the major financing mechanism is out of pocket but in covid 19 what was happened to us uh, government government took over the private sectors and the price were controlled and 95 percentage of people were using government fees and government was giving money to take care or treat covid 19 so we could implement some kind of like a, like a uhc mechanism that is a state funded maybe private agencies were also incorporated but it was largely a state funded thing and evidence is a very important thing that uh, in covid 19 the infodemic was a very big issue and people may think or people may discuss so many things that may not be scientific so moving with scientific methods is very important thing and we have to this we have to be taken as an opportunity to build kind of a resilience so that the people's awareness will be increased and in the future pandemics it is going to be very helpful and so many things i have to i can speak about the 
the mechanisms by which Kerala was fighting against this particular pandemic. And another one important thing is uh, the, the keeping the other public health uh, systems is very important. Because immunization, people cannot move and get vaccine for their children. If you are not able to provide vaccination, their broad doorsteps, other vaccine preventable diseases are going to be emerged. So that is a very important thing. So COVID-19, just like it was a crash course, and we were, yeah, as a community, actually our resilient mechanism in our health system were tested. And I think most of the communities all over the world, including Kerala, was successfully come out of that. And so many things helped us. And now this is the time that we have to in, in just go back and learn what are the things that we that helped us and what are the things we, that we have to strengthen and what are the things uh, that we have to correct. These things are very, very important. Thank you very much. I think so. You took us uh, what what Irene said, what Reda said, what uh, Professor Wong said to kind of application. But for me, I need to ask you this question, and I think uh, it it might apply to a lot of many countries where we have got a federal and a provincial kind of, kind of a two kind of governance structure. Uh, how how does uh, a provincial versus federal uh, kind of relationship uh, really uh, plays role as far as creating this kind of response is concerned. So in Indian context, how Indian uh, central government and state governments uh, uh, kind of coordination uh, is, is uh, playing a role as far as uh, generating such kind of response is concerned. Uh, so actually a very good question. It is really a real, real issue or real challenge we, that we have to discuss. Uh, one thing is, uh, India is a democratic country and it is a large country with so many so high population. And if you look at the health system in different states in India, it is different. The health indicators are very, very different. In some aspect of the country, the infant mortality rate is as low as five per thousand. In some other part, it is as high as 50. So these kinds of uh, issues there. So the resource allocation is, is a challenge. So uh, but there is, uh, in India, what, what our experience was, somehow it was a smooth thing and we were helped by this kind of a federal approach because ICMR was taken to the charge and they were building labs and they were giving suggestions and they were giving recommendations, guidelines. And this is one thing that happened that ICMR, even if it is basically a research organization, it has come out with uh, some kind of a an agency which can manage the entire pandemic. And really some problems were there because of the federal relationships, maybe some politics were there, but as a whole, I think it was emerged or it was trying to, uh, to, uh, to address all these things. For example, the vaccination. India was uh, coming out with the largest vaccination uh, campaign all over the world. And definitely government of India was helping us for all these things. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Anish. I mean, uh, we, we, we are going to open kind of uh, the floor uh, to, to question and answer. But prior to that, uh, based on the conversation that we have uh, 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 heard so far, we have a small uh, kind of poll uh, for uh, entire audience uh, uh, to respond to, which primarily talks about uh, uh, resilience and important factors. So uh, may I uh, ask my colleague to run that poll and the input of the poll will also help us in kind of steering into the discussion. Shushma? Sure, Malik. Uh, thank you so much. So I launch the poll now. Uh, kindly let me know when the screen is visible. So here goes the first question. Screen is my is screen visible? visible? Screen is so visible, everything. thank you. Yeah. So uh, the first question is, what has helped to strengthen the COVID-19 response? Uh, you can uh, rate it uh, on the scale of three, where one being the low lowest and three being the highest. So against each uh, response, you have to rate it. So we have community participation, government-led state response, global response, global health institutional response, uh, that is from WHO, World Bank, USAID, and uh, final is uh, donor community. 
and we also have uh, below there is if there are any comments where you think uh, there are some uh, important elements other than this you can include uh, under question 2 like any other comments yeah i i kindly request all of you to participate in this session The poll has disappeared. Can you reshare yeah. that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. I'll... I relaunched the poll. Is it visible now? Yes, please. we'll wait for 10 more seconds and go to another uh, uh, question please okay we will end uh, this question and we will go for next session next uh, uh, poll we can wait for 10 seconds i think so we have got yeah i'm uh, going to share the results of this first question Uh, most of you have answered for uh, government led response uh, state response and community participation was uh, has helped uh, to strengthen the covid 19 response uh, i'll share the second question now uh is the same question the yeah yeah this is the question 2 i request all to uh, on, uh, this give your opinion on this question number 2 question is can you rate the following elements based on their importance to build resilient health system so you can rate it uh, similarly to question number 1 from uh, on a scale of 3 after uh, we will give 90 seconds for the participants to answer this yeah
Shushma, I think so. We are done. Can we end the poll now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll end this poll. So uh, for this question, most of you have answered like leadership and governance is the uh, most important element. So I'll uh, launch the third question now. This is a single uh, choice question where you have like inherent quality and external outcome as two options. I have to choose one. Yeah, yeah. I assume everyone has answered this. So I'll end this poll. So most 84% uh, of people have told that inherent quality is the uh, resilience is an inherent quality. Thank you so much. Uh, we are done with this uh, poll session for this. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Shushma. Thank you. So, so the object of this poll session was was to get a broader sense from the community on what is important and what is not important, and when we were kind of uh, going through a, a kind of a review and, and talking to expert, the last question where which which I, I get that that uh, uh, people had a kind of more kind of uh, a challenge in answering is because as of today, that's an important question for us as well. That whether a health system resilient is an inherent quality or we need to build a health system resilience once there is a shock. And uh, what we have found so far is that uh, the resilient health system is more of an inherent quality, but that's what we wanted to kind of uh, uh, bring on to the table from the larger audience. But uh, going further, I think so, uh, now we can open the floor for, for questions from the colleagues out there. There are already two questions uh, in the chat box. So I will start with them. In the meantime, if you want to uh, kind of uh, post more questions, you may do that. So there was the first question uh, from uh, Professor Mushtaq uh, from Brack, if I'm incorrect. Uh, uh, in terms of what is the best example of resilient health system in the context of, of COVID and what is the secret about it? So uh, I, may, I may ask uh, uh, Reda or, or Irene to respond to that. If, if there, are, there are any countries which you would say that they have got uh, resilient health system based on the framework analysis and your other work beyond what we have published recently. So may I go to uh, Irene first and then to Reda on any countries that you would like to say that these are these are these are better country as far as their, their resilience is concerned and the reason behind it. Um, thank you, Malik. Uh, that's a tricky question. Uh, <laughs> I think, um, I mean, I think here, rather than focusing on one single country, that's the best example. I think it's really thinking about what we can learn from each other here. And, and there might be different lessons from different countries that manage to deal with um, certain things quite well and, and show resilience in, in some areas and maybe, you know, learn in, in terms of what they could do to be more resilient in others. Um, I mean, again, you know, just going back, I guess, to my personal interest about how we measure these things, I think another, you know, question that emerges from this question is, what do you mean by the 
most, you know, I mean, coming back to all of the, the, the panel debate, what do you mean by a resilient system? So if I were to answer this, taking the perspective that, you know, we took thinking about health system performance assessment, I guess, um, the way we would define the most resilient health system would be the, the health systems that were able, you know, to continue to operate at previous levels, um, or, you know, even managed to improve over the period uh, of the COVID pandemic. And, and I think, um, it, well, it's hard to assess health systems similarly on that aspect. So, you know, it's very hard to answer this question, I guess, again. Uh, but if we if we think about some of the the outcome measurements that we have and, and we look at maybe excess mortality, that might be one way to try to look at who's been the most resilient and then think back to what led these systems to, to prevent this. So was it, you know, I mean, we saw the polling questions too. Was it that there was a strong leadership in the system? Was it that they were able to mobilize their workforce and pull um, ex more existing capacity into the system? What was it that they were able to roll out like, a, you know, quick and effective vaccine programs and integrate that within the health system? And there might be different lessons there to be learned about best practice that isn't just focusing on one system. So. I'm kind of dodging the question here by not giving a, a one single country because I think that we would miss a lot of uh, potential for learning from each other if we did that. And I think uh, the the question is here: what are the, what are countries that have done good strategies? And thinking back to you know the functions or the building blocks, and and here again, you know our framework can be useful in doing that in looking at the assessment criteria of the different functions to try to identify where some systems were able you know, to really perform well and keep their functions performing at a high standard or even to change them to respond to the crisis. And that's what we should look at. So the best practices rather than the single country that kind of did the best in the pandemic. Uh, thank you, Anishwet. And I, 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 this was, was an answer expected from Professor who worked on the framework. Uh, Veda, would you like to respond or do you want to align to, the, to what, what, what Irene said? Uh, thank you. Yes, I think I would um, tell a similar um, path in responding to this question and just to say that um, I think it might be premature or difficult to say that one con this country was better than the other. And even when we look at the response, uh, various response parameters that could be used the question would be at what cost? Because if res resilience is not something that just automatically shows up um, in um, emergencies or in, in times of crisis, I think we've said it over and over again, it needs to be built even in times of normalcy so that when the emergencies um, occur, it is, um, and the system is, is adapting and, uh, and absorbing the shock, it is not at an excessive, so much cost. I think in COVID-19 context, we've seen that even in places where there seemed to be, you know, some kind of good response, it was at a very high cost in terms of the econ economic costs, in terms of um, the social aspects, the costs, on, um, on social aspects of the society and, and different uh, and other areas that we can look at. So it, I would say that it's something we, it, we would, it would be better as um, Dr. Alina also said, to look at what um, good practices exist from different places rather than focusing on one country or rating one as better than the other at this, at this stage. And not just, and even looking beyond the response itself what can we learn from the recovery processes? I think even although the pandemic is, um, many countries are beginning or have been looking towards recovery. How are they taking lessons from the pandemic to build back better? How are we incorporating the different lessons to, to make sure that the, the health systems are better equipped even in times of normalcy, you know, towards um, the next, um, you know, emergency or and, and to the day-to-day -day, um, smaller events and, and uh, challenges that they're faced with. So I think I'll stop there and uh, thank you for the question. Uh, thank you very much. We have a question from uh, Dr. Sunil Kumar Joshi from Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, 
uh, i think so uh, he 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 wants to tease about uh, health policies not based on evidence and unlikely to function properly i think so uh, evidence based policy making uh, dr joshi is a cycle that we all need to follow and i think so uh, it, it takes us to the point that i think so rega uh, uh, professor uh, 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 zain made on on uh, the use of data in evidence making policy uh, so uh this is uh, professor anish i think so this is i think so a, a number question for you does the beds in kerala include private sector or only public sector when you do the assessment of the beds or the infrastructure would it uh, include public sector or it would include both public and private sector thank you uh thank you it include both private and public because we cannot uh, earmark the entire number of beds for covid because other services has to be there so we have to earmark some uh, beds for covid and even in private sector government was purchasing some beds so that they can provide the universal health coverage schemes through that beds so this is the beds allotted for both private and government together for covid 19 management uh there is a question from uh, uh, parvati ramakrishnan uh it's like what is uh, can do we have that question on on the board please so she kind of again uh, alludes to the inherent versus external kind of thing that inherent uh, internal quality influences inherent resilience which affects external outcomes and then it affects as as a feedback loop uh, i don't know whether pavitra uh, can you just is it a question or it was in response to the to the question that we had asked inherent versus external quality can you just uh, uh, put a clarification in the meantime i'll take a question from uh, professor vijay uh, uh, yelandi how important is quantity versus quality of social capital and resilience uh i think so i'll i'll go back to irene uh, first and, and and professor zeng later on because it is both a framework question and a country level question that quantity versus quality of social capital uh, in the resilient health system what is more important um i mean i guess both are important i mean if you have a lot of uh, quantity of poor quality um then i don't know uh you know it, but if you also have too little of a high quality i guess it, it really would probably depend on the context but can i take this moment to 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 um maybe show the framework and think about where that would fit in and also sure. to respond to a question that i see from jackel which asks about good examples uh, of the functions by the framework um sure. So one sec, let me just um, uh, pull it up. Um, so I'm not sure if it's visible to everyone, um, but maybe this helps also to to uh, clarify, I guess, a little bit about uh, what I'm talking. I think it looks quite noisy uh, on the slide, and it's because this is a representation of the framework that shows all of the the proposed areas of assessment. But but really quickly to just talk you through. you know when when i was talking about how we conceptualize resilience we were thinking of the final goals of the health system so these shouldn't seem anything new these are very consistent and we tried here to be very consistent with previous frameworks and previous previous conceptualizations of what are the final goals of the system so here we're thinking about achieving health improvement protecting the population from financial risks having a people centered system and providing these goals in an equitable and efficient way. So for us resilience is maintaining this level of performance in the face of an external shock. And and a shock um can influence the system in many places. You know, it could be a shock to governance, it could be a shock to resource generation, it could be a shock to financing and that would depend on the shock. And in COVID, um their shock was in many parts of the system. uh and uh and it might be in different parts in different countries um but then there's a, there's a few things that have come out in the discussion in particular that we've been talking about for example availability of workforce or availability of infrastructure and equipment such as vaccines and so here you know when we look at the different functions of the system which we've defined in these four colored boxes we have governance resource generation service delivery and financing 
we've identified certain areas of performance that we will look at to measure how well the functions themselves are performing. And these are these yellow boxes. So one yellow box corresponds to each of the functions. This yellow box is the assessment areas that we would use to see how well resource generation is performing. This yellow box here looks at how well your governance um, it, of the system is performing. Governance is tricky because there's also governance of resource generation, governance of service delivery, governance of financing. And you can see we have different indicators for all of those that would be more specific. So to just to give you an example there, governance of the health system here, we would think of, you know, evidence-based decision-making coming back to our previous discussion. How much are you, um, are you uh, drawing on evidence-based policy um, as a health system? And that would be kind of at the health system governance level. Whereas in service delivery, if we think of governance, this might be, you know, how much do you have quality assurance mechanisms in your service delivery, which is slightly different, you know, in terms of, uh, of the scope of governance. So these yellow boxes give us suggested assessment areas to think about how well our functions are performing. And within a shock like COVID, a number of these assessment areas might be affected. And different ones might be more or less affected in different systems. So when I was talking about learning from one another and trying to identify best practices, it would be looking at these assessment areas to understand, you know, was there in certain countries really a, a shock to the availability of the workforce? Because many, many, um, uh, you know, maybe you had low numbers to begin with, uh, and maybe there was a, a big influence because a, a lot fell ill at the same time or high levels of burnout. So what is the system? First of all, is the system monitoring that, which takes us kind of back also to governance? Are you collecting the relevant data and do you have infrastructure to do that? And if you are, how do you deal with this um, issue of availability and respond to it? And here you might identify uh, strategies that are interesting to learn from from one another. Um, and so, so again, I, I talked about financing, I guess, in my initial presentation of the framework, it might, uh, the, the pandemic might af affect, um, you know, sustainability moving forward. And maybe this goes to the question about the feedback loop and how do we understand how the shock affects the quality of the system, which can then create more of an impact on the outcomes. That was the, the question that was answered previously. And, and again, it's by understanding how are these assessment areas able to be maintained at a good level of performance within countries? Or do you see that the shock affects those areas in a way that we need to address? So our idea with the framework is just to provide maybe more of a, a framework or a heuristic for thinking about what are the ways that we could assess how well any one of these functions are performing and how do we maintain those levels of performance or even improve them in the face of a shock? So I don't know if, if seeing the framework helps maybe to, to, um, to put some context behind some of the types of strategies that I was talking about, but that's very much how at least using the framework, I would conceptualize resilience. It's about understanding, if you like the status quo of the system and understanding where the shocks influence the system and what the system is doing to respond to those to maintain these structures and be able to provide constant or better levels of those final goals. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that answered the, the question from, from Paul L. And so I guess coming back to social capital and resilience, you know, it would depend on the system. It would depend on your starting point and, and thinking about what is the current quantity and quality that you have and how is it impacted and what can you do to bring that back to a good level or even a better level so that you can maintain those final goals. Uh, so, so uh, colleagues, I think so there, are, there are loads of questions. I'll, I'll just take a last, last question because there's another session which is following up. Uh, so the last question from Don is that is a threshold when we talk about resilience. I think so that's because in our, in our conversation also we were told that we need to have surplus of human resources, surplus of infrastructure, surplus of that. So in that context, you know, uh, uh, do you think that there is a threshold which kind of helps in measuring resilience? Uh, so any, 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 any response from that, Irene Reda? Uh, uh, yes, sir. So I guess in our framework, the, we're, we're defining the threshold, I guess, as country specific. So we say if before the shock, you had a certain level of performance, a resilient system is one that is able to withstand that shock. And so, so continue to perform at that level or continue to improve. Um, so the, the, the threshold for us would be, I mean, resilience is being able to, you know, to continue to perform despite the shock. Uh, so, so it's a it's a relative level, I guess, rather than an absolute that, that uh, would be, I guess, the way the framework would be conceptualized. 
Yeah, so I, I'm told to uh, cut down. So I think so. I need to kind of uh, wrap up the session. Uh, and, and before doing that, uh, uh, I need to thank Eileen, Reda, uh, Professor Zen, and Anish for being panelists. It has been fantastic conversation. Uh, and what, what we have learned is that I think so. There are various elements uh, uh, to define health system resilience, uh, but it's 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 the inherent characters of health system uh, to kind of bounce back to the level they are, and 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 the leadership and governance play a very very crucial role in in the way they kind of bounce back. But now in this evolving globalized world, I think so there are certain elements where countries' dependency on on the global community will remain. And again, it depends upon the inherent resilience on 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 the indicators or the inputs that that they have. But I think so. And 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 the most important thing that that came out also is that there is a need of learning from what's happening right now, what has happened so far. Uh, and and, uh, and 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 so I, I'll end up uh, right there. I think that there are certain questions we will kind of try to get response, come back to you. And in future, we may come out with to all the colleagues who are part of the group and form a small group to kind of initiate dialogue or keep on this ball rolling where we can learn from each other. And with that, uh, once again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining this session, especially Professor Irene, Professor Zeng, Reda, and Anish for, for, for answering questions and, and sharing the, your thoughts. Thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Ma. Thank you, Malik. Uh... I'd like to take this opportunity to ask everybody who's there uh, to uh, come live and out of their videos uh, and switch on their videos so that we can get a historical moment in the picture together. as many as possible on giving it half minute more so that we get everybody. When, when the video gets on and we are on, on, on this view, you know so many colleagues out there. Thank you very much colleagues for being here. Uh, Thank you, Shivani, for taking that picture for history. And, and then I'd like to say what a warm thank you to all of you for sharing this experience with us and uh, also allowing us to have the privilege of having so many of you to be here to participate with us. So it's a big thank you. And there are so many that we heard in terms of how to maintain and improve performance, recent shocks, flexible shocks, finance, service delivery, importance of having uh, enough capacity, excess capacity, looking at indicators on an everyday basis rather than just at shocks, resilience at what cost, resonance and reasons to build back better, being there and looking at the flexibility of how to take things forward, continuing to perform besides having shocks and behind the shock. So the takeaways are enormous and they will continue to build and will bring us back to build back better. So I'd like to say thank you to all of us who have been here this, mo this afternoon, morning, and uh, to take forward the next conversation, we'll give you a 10 minute break and we'd like to bring back the next subject as interesting for you to bring uh, to be here. This is going to be on disease surveillance and systems for resilience and we're looking forward to that. So give us your, a 10 minute break. We will still be here. You can take that break and come back and we're looking forward to the next set of experts who will speak to us this afternoon and morning for peer-to-peer -peer learning. Thank you so much.
Eu temo. Thank you for your patience. Um, and in the interest of time, I will start right on time. Um, our second session this afternoon is on disease surveillance systems for resilience. Um, it's one of the pillars that we have undertaken as the part of the Global Learning Collaborative. And surveillance by, you know, by far plays one of the most critical roles during the pandemic in the prevention and early detection timely emergency alerts and mobilizing appropriate response. So to take over this session, uh, I would request uh, Dr. Srikant Kalaskar, our senior technical specialist in public health and capacity building, 
to take forward the session. Shrikari. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uma, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I would like to start the session uh, by sharing by sharing some of our background work, which we are currently doing in, uh, in, in thematic area of surveillance. So I hope uh, uh, all of you have attended the first sessions and was uh, with us from uh, the start of this session. So uh, those who are joining for this session uh, itself, uh, for them, uh, for benefit of them, uh, I would like to just brief about Global Learning Collaborative for Health System Resilience. It is an initiative of Access Health International started with the uh, support from Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, we have been working uh, since last six to eight months on various thematic areas. So we have identified four thematic areas for uh, as a priority for this particular uh, collaborative uh, in, in place of learning. So th those uh, thematic areas are surveillance, rapid response, preparedness, and uh, resilient social security networks. So to start with, uh, we have uh, started working on uh, disease surveillance for health system resilience. We have done some background work uh, under the thematic area of surveillance. I would just like to run you through all uh, for with this background. So uh, just to give you a background, we all know that uh, since last five decades, uh, the number of emerging infectious diseases have been increased. Like uh, we have seen recurring uh, outbreaks of influenza and Ebola viruses. We have also seen uh, dramatically expanded uh, range of impact of diseases like chikungunya and Zika viruses. We have seen uh, outbreaks of SARS-CoV-1 in 2002 and SARS-CoV-2 in 2019 and 20, uh, with which we are still battling. So uh, an important principle of responding to any infectious uh, diseases or Im emerging infections is to control the outbreak at the source. So for that purpose, we all aware that backbone is the surveillance. So how this fight with the emerging infectious diseases can be strengthened with collaborations. So there are three aspects of collaboration which we thought uh, are, are very, very important like research and knowledge with this collaboration, we can understand and defeat the pathogens with global supply, which, which again, very, very important aspect in terms of uh, trade, ensuring the efficient global supply for necessary materials and uh, warning of future outbreaks as a third collaborative aspect. So an effective surveillance system helps in an early detection of emerging disease outbreaks, which in terms uh, helps us in containing that outbreak or epidemic in the localized area. So for this particular purpose, uh, sorry. so for this particular purpose, uh, we need to strengthen our surveillance system. So we all know that at, at global level, there are various regulations or guidelines developed by very, various multilateral bodies. So one of the such uh, regulation is international health regulation, I think, which is the most important regulations for uh, guiding the whole health system throughout the world. So which provides a legal framework to prevent, control, and protect against public health emergencies and provide public health response for preventing the international spread of diseases. So we all know after the outbreak of SARS-CoV-1, uh, in 2005, it, IHR has been revised uh, to strengthen the various eight core public health capacities, out of which surveillance is uh, one of uh, those eight core capacities which countries need to develop. But we understand that uh, IHR has remained the most important legal instrument, but it, it has been keep evolving from time to time. So, so, uh, so consequently in 2014, 29 countries with uh, WHO, food and agriculture organizations, UN has came together and formulated one more agenda, which is called as global health security agenda. And now more than 60 countries are part of it. And, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, helping uh, the IHR compliance, which, which has been formulated in 2005. So what are the pillars of global health security agenda? So there are three pillars, early detection, prevention, and rapid response. So early detection, it it's completely depends on this, how strong the surveillance system of the country or the region is. 
and which in turn help for preventing and avoidable epidemics as well as rapid response and effective response to the any outbreak in the localized context so uh, we we have come up with this particular framework which talks about interlinkages across various domains of healthcare and its relation with the one health as a concept so i will start here from the bottom like health and allied sectors where where we can see this vicious cycle of risk assessment risk communication risk management and risk mitigation so risk assessment can be strengthened if the surveillance system of that particular country is very strong and which in terms help us in gathering the knowledge about the outbreak or the epidemic in that country and which can be conveyed to various sectors involved in controlling or managing that particular epidemic or the outbreak and of course the uh, it can also help in strengthening the various health systems aspects and in terms helping the resilient making the health system resilient uh, again risk assessment or surveillance will also help in identifying which are the areas in which health system should uh, should invest or put their resources in we all know that public health is a very resource constrained area where resources has to be used very efficiently so surveillance again help in that aspect as well where the workforce data architecture leadership should involve or invest in uh, as well as as we discussed the health security uh, in, in like we have health, international health regulations global health governance various transparency and accountability policies data pathogens intellectual properties etc those these these all elements are interlinked to each other and had effect of Uh, strengthening each of the aspect with another domain of the healthcare so so what 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 we are looking here for the surveillance so we know there are several ways of uh, conducting a disease surveillance or collecting data for surveillance so some few of the them uh, we have listed here like uh, Uh, we know there are traditional methods of uh, public health surveillance or disease surveillance along with that there are new emerging methodologies like digital pharmacovigilance electronic health records data through digital surveillance or using genomic surveillance but but all all this cannot be implemented by each and every country or the region given the limited resources so each country can think uh, which which of these are more important for them and which uh, in which method they can invest in or it is important to pool resources and share critical information and technology in timely and transparent manner to gather more and more effective data through surveillance and share it with uh, our neighboring countries or globally for battling that particular outbreak or new uh, organism uh, so we know there are various concerns various doubts uh, related to data sharing specifically the health data or the data of surveillance uh, shall be shared or not shared or how uh, how it will not be misutilized so uh, recently in 2018 uh, the, the the paper has came up from the chatham house which which talk about seven principles of sharing the public health surveillance data uh, so first a principal is trust building then they talk about enhancing value addition planning data sharing quality data legal context of data sharing data sharing agreements and monitoring and evaluation in terms of whole cycle of data sharing is it timely is it effective are they sharing the whole data so all these principles uh, i think countries can uh, follow and maybe uh, data sharing can benefit most of the countries and even the world so why why we are here today what what we are going to discuss uh, in this panel so we have listed these three objectives in particular so first objective of this panel discussion is to discuss and explore explore various sub themes of surveillance uh, system which which can be taken forward by this collaborative or the thematic area uh, second objective is to learn from country experiences of our panelist which you, to whom i am going to soon introduce uh then uh, again like how digital technologies digital landscape data sharing genetic surveillance or advanced system of laboratories can help in strengthening the surveillance system so these are with this all objectives i would like to introduce our panels today so we have uh, dr mohammad akhtar hussain uh, he is a public health physician from barwon southwest public health uni uh, unit barwon health uh, victoria victoria australia so i would like to just show his bio 
Yeah, so, so Dr. Hussein is a fellow of Australian Faculty of Public Health Medicine and completed his primary medical education and a doctor in medicine uh, from India. He obtained his PhD degree in epidemiology and public health from University of Queensland. Dr. Hussein has extensive experience working in public health, including infectious diseases, health system research, primary health care, and other areas. He is currently working as a public health physician in Bowen Southwest. Sorry, Dr. Shri, can't disturb you. Uh, we can't see the bio. Yeah, that that that's fine. Uh, uh, so so during his fifteen years of clinical and public health research career. Uh, he has published several papers in uh, reputed international journals uh, or journal articles. Uh, second uh, panelist we have today with us is Dr. Sudipto Roy, uh, who is a scientist E and a deputy director, Indian Council of Medical Research, Department of Health Research, uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. Uh, Dr. Sudipto Roy has been working in field of public health since last 14 years and has extensive experience of uh, working in healthcare research, surveillance, and program management. Uh, he has completed his MD in community medicine from uh, Mumbai Medical College. And uh, he has worked as a national polio surveillance project as a uh, surveillance medical officer. He has also worked in various organizations like FHI 360 and with John Hopkins University project. Uh, he he has a keen interest in the uh, field of epidemiology and disease surveillance. In addition, he has a special interest in field of implementation research and has fair experience in writing and conducting projects in this field. Uh, we have our third panelist today as Dr. Manjunath Shankar, who is a head pre-award and technical head at Samrit Healthcare Blended Finance Facility, supported by USAID and he implemented by IIP Global. He did, his, he did his MBBS from Bangalore University, India, and Masters in Health Administration from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, India. He has completed his doctorate studies in International Health, Health Systems Track at John Hopkins School of Public Health from Baltimore. He has worked with Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Atlanta as a Prevention Effectiveness Fellow in 2010. And then he, he continued as Senior Service Fellow till 2017. He has over 18 years of work experience in international public health and was involved in CDC's EOC response to the West African Ebola outbreak. He has worked as an advisor, consultant, health economics, and infectious disease moderator, uh, infectious disease modeler for different entities, various capacities. He has co authored numerous peer reviewed journal articles. And uh, lastly, we have uh, our moderator and our technical facilitator for uh, surveillance theme, uh, Dr. Habib Hassan Farooqi. He is an additional professor at Indian Institute of Public Health, Delhi, uh, Public Health Foundation of India. Dr. Hassan is a public health expert with more than 18 years of experience in teaching and research. Dr. Hassan has led faculty on uh, lead faculty on infectious disease epidemiology and pharmaceutical economics at Public Health Foundation of India. Previously, he has worked as a surveillance medical officer as, at WHO. So I would like to hand it over to Dr. Hassan now for a panel discussion and uh, taking the session forward, please. Over to you, Dr. Habib Hassan. Well, thank you very much. I hope I am audible. Yes, you are audible. Thank you very much. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank Access Health, Dr. Reddy, Malik, Shrikant, and others for having me here. And I also like to take this opportunity to welcome our eminent panelists, Dr. Akhtar Hussain from Australia, Dr. Roy from ICMR, and Dr. Shankar from IPE Global. And as uh, Shrikant briefly touched upon the core thematic area about surveillance and its role in resilience, uh, I will just start with uh, just to start with giving a brief overview about the framework that Shrikant touched upon. Uh, we looked at this particular concept from the perspective of strengthening global health security because we know that the pathogens, especially the emerging pathogens, uh, don't really respect national and international boundaries. And a pathogen, an emerging pathogen or any infectious disease in one part of the world is threat to everyone. And with this rapid globalization and uh, I mean, fast moving 
uh, travel networks for trade commerce as well as human transfer uh, has potential to introduce any new pathogen in one part of the world to another part of the world. And we have seen this uh, with several infectious disease in the recent past. And uh, with that particular context, we think that it is really, really important to have a very robust surveillance system at the local level, at the country level, and also about uh, this data sharing across the countries, because it's really important to have access to the core data with regards to not only information on emerging outbreak, but also information on the pathogens to develop diagnostics, therapeutics, and preventive technologies. So with this background, I think uh, we can start our discussion by first learning about the country experiences uh, for this current outbreak, especially the unknown pneumonia, which was then known as in December 2030 when it started spreading in the Wuhan and was later identified as a coronavirus outbreak uh, in early January. Uh, so uh, I would start by asking this specific question about the country experiences. Uh, first to our international expert, Dr. Akhtar Hussain, uh, we would appreciate if he could touch upon how Australia has been doing the surveillance for the corona pandemic because we know Australia has been really lucky and they they actually initiated uh, timely introduction of non-pharmaceutical interventions so they were actually spared for the devastating impact in the initial few months but later they actually had to bear the burnt uh, so I would appreciate if Dr. Hussain can actually throw some light on how they have been able to manage this outbreak and what are the systems in place to respond to such emerging threats. Thank you, over to Dr. Hussain. Thanks Dr. Habib uh, for, being, for uh, being, being me for this panel discussions. Uh, you are right in saying that Australia is unique in um, enjoying the liberty and, and the initial pandemic when it started in 2020. We live in a quite open en environment where probably well most of the countries were struggling through the cases where here in Australia we are living a normal life but um, that's apart from and Australia is considered as a world leader in containment and managing the emerging condition, uh, emerging variant of COVID. Uh, apart from a couple of brief snap lockdown, you might have heard in the news that uh, most of the states uh, were quite fine uh, in terms of uh, managing um, the conditions uh, internally as well as uh, not letting the infection in in the beginning. Uh, the majority of the new cases those that started coming during those period were from uh, other community out um, community transmissions. I can say that happened initially, those were mainly from the overseas uh, travelers or the overseas uh, citizens who, um, or Australian citizens who came from overseas. However, that quickly, um, we different state governments quickly responded to those threat and uh, in, a, in a very short time, we managed to live in a zero COVID scenario. Um, Australia is very, is, is a very diverse country. And as you know, that it has got different states and each states have got their own public health system and they are responsible for managing their own uh, communicable disease control and surveillance activities. So the experience is quite different in different uh, states. Some of the states when COVID started were not prepared enough to deal with something like this big um, the, um, impact which has got both social as well as health impact. Whereas some of the country, some of the states have got very good surveillance networks. So they initially managed it quite too well. Uh, and overall, with the snap lockdown and the closure of, um, closer of the um, um, country border helped in developing that system, developing a system which uh, people were the, um, for effective contact tracing activities, um, as well as developing the testing strategy for the whole of country, which helped a lot. Um, uh, never in the initial period, the case numbers gone up, which mainly is because of effective communication as men can't mention in the initial side that effective risk communication. So that that's one of the um, positive points to informing or risk communicating to each and every community. Uh, we know that it's a diverse country. So people are uh, everyone, the people are from different cultural and linguistic background. So how to effectively communicate risk uh, so that people can understand and follow the rules and guidelines. 
Um, so one of the learning that I can say from uh, this overall response is act quickly and strongly and decisively based on the in, uh, incoming data. So uh, based on the international uh, evidence that was coming in the beginning, uh, the lockdown was probably might be the most effective way that uh, we restricted infection coming into the country. Uh, federal government responded quickly, closing, uh, starting the mandatory quarantine, which is the regulatory approach uh, for containing the infections. Police were dispersed to each home, those who were in quarantine to check on them, uh, whether they are in isolation or not. Um, and then not only international border, but the within within Australia, the state border, individual states, they closed their borders. So that prevented spreading of infection within between within different states as well. And uh, states were independent of each other. So one when one state um, uh, responded and contained the infections, they, are op they, 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 um, they were able to open up completely. Um, whereas other states, they, they were trailing and they, they come and then joined the uh, same uh, trajectory as well. So um, there were some um, pushback as well because of uh, some of the outbreaks that started in the beginning that particularly in Melbourne, which stayed in for longer lockdown, uh, but those were mainly in, in immigrant population or those who are culturally and linguistically background uh, population and they used to live in close uh, surroundings or, or with high population density and that was one of the reason of infection spreading quite high. And uh, the other uh, learning from me is that is involving everyone. Probably the messaging which gone in the beginning was not adequate for them to understand what, the, what are the risks associated with the infection, which we learned quite early, uh, quite early and government involved um, all the different multicultural organization uh, to bring them on board and, and develop strategy which suit to them and which could be, which is appropriate to them and easily understood by the whole community. Same with, with the Aboriginal community, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community as well. We know that they are, um, they are a disadvantaged, disadvantaged community. So bringing them on board at their community organization or community control organization to help them and empower them to develop their own strategy for COVID safe strategies, which helped a lot. So these are the, some of the learning from the initial days. And I think this, uh, we, we moved quite smoothly for quite some time unless Delta um, came in. Uh, but in the meantime, when Delta came in, uh, we, were, we have started our vaccination. So, uh, and then when we went for a stronger lockdown, uh, possibly for a couple of months, when we caught up with all the vaccination campaign and, and managed to vaccinate majority of the population. And I, I tend to disagree with you saying that you probably felt the burnt of the disease, but I would say probably we, we felt, but in a more uh, milder way. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if I may just uh, dwell a little deeper with regards to the surveillance, uh, the theme that we are now discussing in this particular panel, uh, can you please elaborate on what different surveillance tools are you currently deploying or employing to actually get a hang of the disease spread within the communities and within the states within Australia. So for example, I'm trying to understand, are you deploying uh, genomic uh, sequencing tools? Are you doing water, wastewater surveillance? Are you doing digital surveillance yep. uh, at the country level? And if you can share your experiences and the way they have been implemented in the country with regards to what are the specific mechanisms you have put in place with regards to data sharing and confidentiality and privacy protection of the individuals. Yeah. Thanks, Abhi. Uh, that's a very uh, good question. So in terms of surveillance, as we know, Australia has three levels of surveillance. So we have national uh, level, we have state level, and then we have regional or the regional level um, um, the surveillance system. So state at the state, we have national uh, disease surveillance uh, system, whereas at state, we have individual surveillance strategy. So each state Overall, the surveillance strategy is based on the national framework. So, but there are a little bit of differences across states based on what are their priority and how they are coping and, and, and the availability of system. Um, in terms of, uh, so largely it's the community-based surveillance where there are testing facility available for everyone, irrespective of who they are and whether they have symptoms or not. So it's changing gradually based on uh, as we are moving into business as usual and we are restricting more and more, but for initially, 
we had we have open um, a testing policy anyone who is uh, a close contact or even if you mild stuff symptoms can come and go through the drive through testing clinic which were um, available uh, most of the places and near easily accessible to everyone uh, for a testing results um, were easily available within 24 hours they used to uh, every individual used to used to get message about their testing capacity about their testing results within 24 hours which uh, we did feel a bit of uh, pressure when uh, Omicron came in and, and the system collapsed because of the number of cases um, we started to get with the Omicron and even the lab couldn't cope up. There was a huge delay uh, of, of getting those testing results, but eventually at the same time, we managed to roll out RAT and RAT were RAT's rapid antigen test kits were, um, again, it was free for everyone. Uh, whether uh, whatever may be the the background or whatever maybe the wherever maybe the person is staying it, it was available to uh, everyone uh, free of course so that helped a lot in identifying the disease at, at early stage and then also um, in terms of reporting so there are um, digital tools already in place uh, from um, before omicron even delta as well uh, to record all those so those from the lab we have a huge network of uh, lab public health labs uh, and they used to directly send those um, res test results to the digital surveillance system, which each state have. And then also, if it is a rapid antigen test, um, test then um, it was made mandatory for everyone, those who were positive to report. So there are some public health uh, regulation and, uh, and order came in, which, held, which forced people, or you can say you know, people were forced to report that because in, attached with that was social security or financial incentives. So people recorded all those and that helped um, in identifying the cases at the early stage. Even if you look at the current trend, you can see most of the cases are currently happening in Australia, but that's not the true cases because it's mainly because we are identifying more and more cases uh, because the testing was, uh, we're doing more testing and that's, what, that's one of the reason we are getting more cases. Um, whereas the other surveillance tools that we have in place is the wastewater surveillance to identify uh, any variant of concern. So we, um, and, and that's helping us in identifying whether there are the newer variants are there in VF, uh, B4 or B5 or it is BA2. So, and then accordingly corresponding, we proportionately matching those with the, with the genomic um, sequencing results that we are getting from the PCR to see whether that's the true reflection of what you are seeing in the community and if there are any anything that we need to intervene to to contain that uh, particular infection of course the containment strategy my, is not different from what we have but it helps us in um, communication uh, communicating the risk to the community about uh, being aware and what they are supposed to do so um, these are the, some of the um, digital tools you can say beside that we have targeted messaging services and using geospatial data, using um, postal codes and addresses to correctly identify areas where outbreaks are happening, which age groups are, because we have um, strong reporting system, so we can easily identify different age groups. Uh, we can, uh, we can um, pinpoint to, uh, to the addresses and can have a particular locality which have case are occurring and then we can uh, jump uh, and jump on and can identify from our local resources uh, about the different issues or, or any exposure site um, all those and can and can intervene um, at the right time in in curtailing the transmission so yeah th those are some of the uh, digital tools that we are currently using thank you dr Akbar, for sharing your insights and your um, the strategies that Australia has deployed. Now, coming back to my own country, uh, and I think uh, it's really important to understand the context. Australia predominantly has an NHS type of system with the population widely spread across in the coastal cities, whereas in a country, we have huge population density and population spread across the country. And also, uh, quite interesting, the health system is a mix of public and the private sector, whereas private sector plays a predominant role. And we know that, uh, I would say, loads of data is generated in the private sector, not only in the private clinics, in the private hospitals, but also in the private labs. Uh, though we were lucky that ICMR played a very, very crucial and very important role in the very early stages of uh, the pandemic by deploying a huge laboratory infrastructure across the country for testing. And they also played a key role in actually 
uh, I would say, providing leadership and guidance with regards to strategies for treatment, algorithms for managing the pandemic. Uh, so in that context, I'll ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Roy from uh, ICMR, what, uh, what does he think with regards to leveraging this private sector data that we could have access to with regards to strengthening the surveillance system, either by integrating it with the national surveillance system or by using that from the perspective of early disease detections. Over to Dr. Roy. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, good afternoon to all uh, my colleagues out here. Please let me know if you cannot hear me. All right, so, uh, so surveillance, as we all understand traditionally, you know, simply is, is known as you know, data for action. But what uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has made us realize, and not just COVID, you know, other diseases also have, but COVID mostly is that we probably need to expand it and say that surveillance should ideally be decentralized data for local action, yeah. not just data for action, right? Because I mean, as all, all of us from India know what happens in say, Uttar Pradesh is not probably applicable, not completely applicable to what happens in say Kerala or Tamil Nadu, right? And even within Uttar Pradesh, northern and southern parts would probably behave differently, would need a different uh, response. So local level data systems that are sensitive enough to detect any change in the baseline prevalence or incidence of any health condition, infectious, non-infectious, whatever, that is what is needed and that is what uh, we have realized is, is probably the most important, uh, uh, you can say, uh, uh, change that is uh, needed. And when I say local, it may, it may uh, district level, definitely, sometimes within district also, within blocks, we need probably, you know, uh, much more granular data uh, to understand what's what's going on if the research tries or change in any in, in, in level. Uh, uh, one example, I just I would just like to give one example of how this can be leveraged or how local level, level data uh, can be uh, used uh, is, a, is a modeling simulator that ICMR had uh, 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 brought up. It was published last year so, uh, in 2021. But uh, the modeling exercise, the model, the model that was developed to kind of predict uh, to not only predict and monitor as well as predict any rise in COVID, SARS-CoV-2 infections. It, is, it was done for SARS-CoV-2. It can be adapted for other uh, infections also. Based on this, an uh, easy-to-use uh, simulator has been developed, uh, which, which the NHFW is also now planning to train uh, district-level officials to use. So using simple data, they can, if they, if they can upload this data onto the dashboard, the simulated dashboard, they can understand what's going on in their own district uh, and at, at in, in, in real time. So this kind of, so this is of course a model, but if even if say models, has been, it would be complex for you know, people to develop and understand, even using simple data, surveillance data, but at the local level, uh, uh, would be very uh, would, would would be very useful. That is probably one of the most important findings that we have uh, uh, understood uh, in, in, in from, from our COVID nineteen uh, experience. And this holds true not just for public uh, health in the public health system, but this holds true for the private sector also. I mean, we all know in India there's a huge burden of not burden. I would say a huge uh, chunk of the population goes to the private sector uh, for their illnesses. And that, 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 was, that has been the case for both outpatient as well, primarily outpatient, but in, in, in inpatient also. And hence the systems that we have, the surveillance systems that we have, uh, that, is, that could be easily applicable to the private sector also. One example in COVID, during COVID was the uh, RT-PCR uh, facilities, RT-PCR as well as antigen testing facilities. So as you've mentioned, and as probably uh, uh, some of you would know, uh, ICMA was at the forefront of developing and expanding the whole RT-PCR network uh, specifically for uh, COVID-19. Uh, it started with just one RT-PCR lab in January 2020, which was uh, which started in uh, ICMR NIV National Institute of Virology in Pune. Today, there are 3,389 uh, labs, of which almost 2,000 are in private, and the remaining 1,400 odd are in 
public health uh, institutions, medical colleges, and all. However, they all follow the same principle, RT-PCR, and they have similar reporting systems. So we have a, so all of them are uh, submitting the reports to a centralized database, which is was coming to us, the government, and we are able to analyze what's going on with the testing, with what's going on with the positive rate and the etc. So yes, so there are there are ways, there are systems to leverage the strength uh, and the advantages of the private private uh, sector facilities in any not just in COVID nineteen but in you know any other health condition that that is of uh, interest. I'd like, just like to give you another example. I mean, since we're talking of you know, uh, public-private uh, partnership or leveraging data, another uh, very uh, uh, useful example is the TB case notification. Uh, some of you, or most of you would probably, from India would probably uh, remember that in 2012, in the year 2012, uh, government of India had made TB case notification compulsory and for all, all, all uh, 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 place, private as well as public. And it has worked. And there are some challenges, of course, there are some issues, of course, but it is working. So we have uh, private health practitioners, hospitals, as well as government hospitals, reporting on a single platform, the, you know, the, the uh, information, reporting data regarding uh, tuberculosis, case, uh, diagnosis, et type, et cetera. So yes, there are systems in place to uh, coordinate between or to leverage the private as well as public, however, there are, I mean, as, I, as all of us probably know, there, if there are, there are, there would be some challenges which need to be, which can be, if, if, if there's a will, obviously, if they can easily be overcome and we can use data from private as well as from public and to build up a complete uh, surveillance system for any health condition that, that we are, you know, interested in. Thank you very much for those great insights. Uh, and if I may ask, uh, a more direct question with regards to other tools that ICMR probably would have vision for uh, introducing in this uh, in the country. I mean, are you looking forward towards introducing some kind of predictive analytics based on, say, say social media search words in Google or in Twitter, where people start looking for some kind of disease symptoms or they search for certain keywords, or for example. Uh, any other kind of digital tool which actually tracks the sales of pharmaceuticals, yes. for example, in certain places where the people have started using, say, more uh, antibiotics or started using more antipyretics. I mean, so those kind of, uh, I would say, proxy uh, data, <coughs> points, the surrogate measures leverage and which can free provide a feedback into the traditional systems of data collection with regards to pathogen or with regards to disease. Over to Dr. Roy. Right. So, so what you're basically talking uh, talking about is digital surveillance, if I'm not uh, mistaken, right? Um, uh, kind of. I mean, sure. it's, it's one 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 part of one component of digital surveillance is uh, you know this kind of uh, track tracking social media, tracking internet searches, Google searches, etc. Uh, so, as a as as an institute, we still don't have anything, uh, you know, say on the verge of release or something. But yes, there is talk about this. There is. Uh, uh, there are some research projects. We, we'd like to first test it out, obviously, in a smaller, uh, kind of validate them and see how good the data is. Uh, look at uh, look at how well they correlate with actual data. But so there are some projects. There are some thinking going on about this. However, as I said, I mean, we are not yet at the at the verge of releasing them. But hopefully, let's let's hope that you know sometime soon we will be able to do that. But yes. We, uh, we agree that it is it would be a useful complementary to this, this kind of uh, data. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'll come to Dr. Akhtar and Dr. Roy again. Uh, let me uh, let me ask uh, this question based on his wide global experience to Dr. Shankar. Uh, what does he think with regards to these surveillance tools and technologies? I mean, what is the role of these new technologies, especially with the technology penetration in our country? How do he see the future of these technologies and tools in strengthening the surveillance system in our country? Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having me here. Yeah, so yeah, I will say like uh, the traditional uh, surveillance, if you talk about IDSP or uh, 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 notifiable diseases surveillance system, they play a critical role. 
but the new technologies they can accelerate the the number of the speed and amount of information that is being processed and uh, i think the digital technologies plays a critical role but we should not be swayed away by the uh, like we should not go with the the new fad or the new uh, trend in this about digital health because if you remember uh, in 2010 to 13 google came up with the google flu trends and uh, then it was uh, first year it was very successful and uh, based on just the people who search for flu symptoms etc it was able to predict but second third and then then the google itself admitted that it was a failure it couldn't uh, analyze the prop data properly so i think what we need to do is uh, strengthen the traditional systems of data collection and supplement that and increase their efficiency and effectiveness by using digital platforms over that so for example in uh, let's say uh, in the early phase when uh, icmr was increasing the capacity there was a lack of testing capacity in the country so one innovative approach would have been to use whether we could have used syndromic surveillance at that point in the pandemic uh, uh, instead of just relying on laboratory confirmed diagnosis so for syndromic surveillance to work we need to have a baseline as you said epidemics can only be predicted if we know the baseline so if we have a case definition of fever sore throat let's say loss of taste or loss of smell as one or other symptom uh, two plus one uh, optional so if we have that case definition and if we had that sort of surveillance we couldn't do anything because we don't have that strong traditional system and one of the comments also came that uh, there's no grassroots level the data quality and especially from private sector it is lacking so we don't have a baseline to build on the innovative approaches so another thing we talk about the new new tools genomic surveillance is coming in and we also talked about waste based, waste water based epidemiology so these are all good but one thing we have to learn from this uh, pandemic is uh, we don't know what the future pandemic or the future virus will look like we are lucky enough that this virus was being shed and we could able to detect those shed uh, viral particles in the sewage but what if that is not possible in future what will we do so one lesson and uh, so every time we do any outbreak or ever we always have to keep learning so for example in the ebola the ebola spreads only when the patient becomes symptomatic before that it is not uh, it is not spreading so but here it was a different scenario uh, it was spreading pre symptomatic it was spreading in asymptomatic stage also so we had to adapt our responses to that and uh, uh, it was airborne so to the science had to progress so much to, we had to have come up with a new definition for what airborne transmission is so in this way i think uh, the the lessons to learn from this is uh, we of course we need innovative approaches we need digital technologies and in fact uh, niti ayog uh, they have come up with the public health surveillance 2030 vision where they talk about uh, electronic health records being the core of uh, a digital health surveillance abdm talks about uh, health knowledge exchanges and this is all very good but uh, uh, digital means it's that gigo is there right good in good out or garbage in garbage out so the i really like the comment uh, one person made about the data quality at the grassroots and how do we establish the baselines for how many respiratory infections happen how many uh, gastroenteritis happens what is the baseline for india at the district level etc and how do we do early detection if we don't have a baseline and we can have tools we can have watches smart watches which detect temperature etc but then how do we interfere uh, interpret those findings there will be uh, the big data there will be avalanche of data and information from these systems how do we interpret if we don't have the you know the foundation so i think traditional systems also play a role and uh, uh, like even for example uh, vital vital registration systems if we had a very robust vital registration system this whole debate about the who and their pro estimate about the uh, mortality in india it would not have happened so we need to strengthen vital registration also because we at least we could be able to uh, that's the simplest that's the oldest way of uh, public health to count the number of dead if we cannot do that basic thing all the digital technologies will be creating more noise and we won't be able to interfere from uh, infer from them, not interfere infer from those uh, uh, data sets so yeah
and if i may if i have got time i will just also like to quote one example uh, out of uh, this thing so if uh, people have watched the movie the martian uh, is able to grow potato on mars and that's a very innovative way of doing things but he had hydrogen fuel he had night soil he was able to generate what he was able to be innovative because he had the stuff to do that he had brought potatoes also from this thing but if we don't have those three four things then innovative digital surveillance and others would not help so that's what i feel is traditional systems will also play a role and we need to strengthen that from being more resilient and digital of course we had the traditional will evolve into more digital surveillance in a way and uh, also we should not be swayed away by uh, genomic or this thing so genomic surveillance was good but this is because the virus is mutating fast and we need genomic surveillance what if the virus is not mutating what would be the utility of a genomic surveillance system so we need to debate all those questions and uh, think about it and uh, as i said the pandemic hopefully happens once a century and even if it happens say once in 20 years uh, we the traditional will be useful every year like if you have a vital registration system it will be useful every year and uh, any other sort of waste foster based technology etc may be helpful in this but for that also traditional will be the foundation for those sort of systems excellent thank you for sharing your thoughts dr shankar so what i understood from uh, the discussion that we had so far is uh, as you rightly pointed out that the traditional the traditional methods for surveillance are the way forward but at the same time we also need to leverage this digital technologies to which we have access given the immense sophistication to which they have developed and can help us track these diseases in the real time and i also take point of dr roy who suggested that the icmr and other techno and other primary institutes in the country are doing a testing at i mean a proof of test concepts at their level before implementing these larger technologies uh, for a broader use and also take his point about integration of the private and the public sector data and how best we can leverage the private sector data uh, but i still have this question for both of you with regards to the data sharing not only between the public and the private sector but also the data sharing across sectors so for example sharing data between health sector and other sectors for example the kind of the framework we want to implement for one health and also the data sharing between uh the public sector and also the industry so for example because industry is one of the core players nowadays with regards to availability or access to the technologies whether it is a diagnostic technology or a, a therapeutic technology and also this data sharing and access to data across the countries not only with regards to the core genomes or the access to information but also with regards to sharing equitable sharing of the benefits so what are your thoughts about it uh, what what do you think uh, about i mean what would be the way forward for the country with regards to these data sharing uh, principles or agreements are you aware about best practices that you have seen elsewhere and you would like to uh, share with the audience uh, first dr shankar and then i would be happy to hear the thoughts of dr roy yeah thanks yeah i think uh... this multi sector coordination right from almata declaration we have been talking about inter sector coordination and especially with respect to one health it plays a critical role and uh, and data sharing did happen and uh, i will say that not to the extent that we felt so for example china was able to put out the genome sequence and germany developed the rt pcr test kit and south korea was able to scale the primers so it did happen it's not that uh, Uh, it didn't happen and we should start doing something new but what we need to discuss is we need to strengthen the data sharing and uh, especially in india like uh, there was a covid uh, patient registry was set up but uh, access was not there or uh, uh, other sort of uh, data sharing could have happened uh, many of the states that reported the positive cases didn't have the comorbidity numbers so basic things they were not like uh, for example if you compare the bangalore Uh, war room data set uh, or the publicly available data with uh, what was available from other states or this thing it was lacking so we need to bring uniformity and to bring a data sharing and how to analyze the data and how to give out important critical public health messages those things are critical 
and private sector uh, i am glad that icmr introduced that uh, online reporting of rt pcr because it's very difficult like uh, and uh, in fact uh, in our project also we are trying to do for antimicrobial resistance how anonymized data can be shared between medical colleges the laboratory data about sensitivity patterns how how can we come up with anti biogram at district level so this sort of projects we want to fund in our project so i think uh, we are uh, we should have be open ended towards data sharing and uh, uh, not only there is also an ongoing debate about the patents for vaccine and other issues so that also we need to resolve before the next pandemic hits us and uh, i think uh, uh, intersect i'll just give you some example uh, just a specific example from our country that we learned from this pandemic like if you had asked four five years ago whether the number of migrant laborers in a district is it a concern for ministry of health and everyone would have laughed at you or let's say like it's not in our it's it should be under the department of labor and it should be under they, they should collect the data why should health ministry collect but what happened a lockdown happened we had a migrant labor crisis trying to go to their homes etc and no one could predict that and the mohf was the lead in the incident command system right and uh, we couldn't come up with an effective response to manage that sort of situation so i think we should not forget the mistakes that we made during the lockdown post lockdown before vaccine rollout things like that and i think we should learn and i am glad that the glc uh, for HFR, hsr is doing this sort of work and uh, so intersector just that example will show that ministry of health should have a situational awareness about how many migrant laborers are there what are their socio economic conditions what should be the should the surveillance be this how do we coordinate with ministry of education with ministry of labor uh, ministry of uh, civil aviation all those things will come in a response so i'll stop here thank you thank you dr roy do you want to share your specific experiences with regards to Uh, collaboration with the private sector uh, i mean you highlighted about the vast infrastructure and the network that uh, icmr set up with regards to testing how about your experience of developing the vaccine and have co-sharing a patent with the, the industry and your vision for uh, uh, i would say expanding access to commodities and commodity security in country with regards to these innovations right so yeah so data protection data sharing or even uh, intellectual properties you know uh, talking about those are obviously issues that will crop up uh, when we talk of uh, collaborations so we um, i would like to look at it at two with two levels one is that you can have a, a thing at the at the look at the reg, uh, regulatory level so you either have a regulatory framework or we can have some certain legal directives the difference being that the framework is not mandatory but it's just kind of a guide for institutions to you know follow or to use as reference or may and but for certain data protection rights uh, privacy rights you would need some legal directives also so that is one thing and that's taken up at the top level of the uh, uh, ministry for that the second level is at the level of individual institutions in terms of having a, a, a well laid out memorandum of understanding and memorandum of agreements right so that's between institution that can very well have be between public and private private and private public and private sector so you you uh, you just mentioned about vaccine so as uh, most of you would be aware the uh, co vaccine was developed in partnership by icmr and uh, bharat biotech i think that that, that kind of It, you know, gave us a lot of lessons. It taught us a lot on how, uh, for both both sides, the pharma industry as well as us, you know, how do we move together towards a common goal if there are challenges? You know, how we sort these out. So the MOAs that that the government usually nowadays have have clear cut, especially I think we have we have clear cut definitions uh, and clauses related to IP use, related to data use, related to publication use, related to royalties, etc. It's all available. Uh, I say, in fact, it is up uh, online also. Uh, the guidelines for MOAs between ICMR and in, any institute that would be interested in. So, what from our experience, this is just one example of vaccine during uh, COVID nineteen. But ICMR, we also work with many other institutions in different 
COVID infectious, non infectious. So we have seen at our, at, at our level, having a clear cut MOA is, is, is very useful to kind of iron out these issues related to data sharing and privacy and et cetera. And of course, uh, from our RT PCR experience, uh, in which both private and public, as we just talked about, public and private, since there was a one single system into which all data was being fed, it was agreed to by private institutions as well as uh, all public institutions. That's another mechanism which probably works best during a pandemic, during a time of emergency. But that is also another way of you know sharing data, pooling data together, and making sure that everyone's interests are, are uh, protected. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those insights and sharing the vision uh, for the country. So can I just ask one last question to each of our panelists? Uh, and this is with regards to your recommendation for this collaborative network to work on this particular stream of work that they have taken up, which is surveillance for health system resilience. What as ICMR and what as, uh, uh, I mean, what uh, from your perspective as an expert, do you think the focus of this collaborative should be in this particular stream of work? So first to Dr. Roy, then Dr. Shankar, and then Dr. Akhtar. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, I mean, the, it, 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 it's always welcome. So ICMR or say any other institute, it's, it's always, we always welcome um, any collaborative uh, mechanism, a, a, especially in the field of surveillance, disease surveillance. Uh, we look forward to working with say other public institutions or private, non-governmental, not-for-profit, for-profit, anyone, but who have this you know, uh, common goal uh, towards improving or strengthening, we would say, surveillance within our uh, health systems. So what, uh, so what I think or what we think is moving forward, we probably need a kind of a hybrid system of uh, hybrid model of surveillance, you know, in which you have public, private, as well as digital, digital surveillance. Again, uh, there's a bit of a caveat, we be very careful about that. But yes, a combination of public systems, private systems, bit of digital, combination of active, passive, as I said, as the need arises. Again, as I, I'll again come back to what I started with, it has to be uh, driven by local needs. Surveillance has to be driven by local needs, local conditions, uh, and, 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 and local capacities. So a hybrid model is what something is probably, is this something what we probably look, you know, going ahead to look, uh, look forward to. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, a forum as this, um, uh, so I think uh, Dr. Akhtar gave a good examples of how the surveillance system and uh, predictive modeling, et cetera, helped in the Australian context. And we also learned the genomic surveillance was weak. I think even in the US, it was weak. Only UK had a very strong genomic surveillance and uh, they were able to detect the UK, well, not the UK, the beta variant better, but uh, other countries adopted as soon as that was done. So I think uh, this sort of collaborative is helpful in learning, cross-learning from each other country's experiences. So I think uh, if we had the, uh, the surveillance uh, task force or the group would, uh, what was the desired way of, like uh, what would be the ideal way of working things out? What were the mistakes made during the response? And then what are the specific steps that, uh, like even Niti Aayog or ICMR or government, Ministry of Health can take, and how can the so now the this the Pradhan Mantri Infrastructure Mission, Health Infrastructure Mission is there. So how do we uh, put these learnings into action when we are implementing those missions? So there is ABDM, Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission. There is Pradhan Mantri Digital Infrastructure Mission. There is Health and Wellness Clinic Centers. So all these three are there and the PMJ with their insurance claims and others, they will have a lot of data going forward. So how do we learn, uh, document the lessons that we have learned and what specifically can these three or four initiatives of the government can include and also for the private sector. How can uh, private sector data sharing and how the ABDM, how can it be made more feasible for private sector to adopt? Those things would play a critical role. But uh, 
I think uh, uh, rather than an academic, uh, we need to look, focus on more outdoor application sort of, uh, uh, I would more call it like an applied research, this, is, this sort of exercise. Uh, in uh, CDC, we used to call it hot wash. Like once you do the response, you do a situational analysis, uh, what went well, what went wrong, like that. So this is a hot wash exercise, but at a very broader, not at the national level, but at the regional and distinct level. So I think even the government can also do a hot wash exercise of its own, but uh, I think this is a good initiative and we can do, uh, uh, we can feed more into what, how to prevent future or how to respond better for future pandemics. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Dr. Akhtar, what is your recommendation for this global, this collaborative that has been set up by Access Health? I completely agree with uh, my fellow panelist, uh, Sujitha and Manjunath. The, here, the importance is to have this collaborative um, initiative that started to continue. And, and one of the most important thing here is in terms of particularly disease surveillance is to learn from our mistakes, what we have done and improve upon that and not repeating the same. Um, uh, both of my colleagues uh, or panelists, um, fellow panelists highlighted the need for uh, for a having a stronger surveillance system. So my recommendation or suggestion would be to strengthen and continue with the traditional uh, surveillance system that we currently have in place and then um, add the digital tools which are quite um, quite available. And it's it, digital tools are quite good and, and being helpful for all other clinical monitoring and clinical uh, processes, but it's public health, which is lagging behind and not accepting it uh, at the right time. But we have seen in during the COVID, how rampantly these uh, different digital tools are being used, starting from uh, case detection, contact tracing, um, and then also um, community monitoring or remote monitoring of positive patients at, at different levels. So. Uh, how can we strengthen the whole uh, disease surveillance system and taking use of the advantage, taking advantage um, of the the emerging uh, digital technologies that we currently have? Um, not to um, um, uh, the most important thing, if, even if we are doing all these things, uh, is the availability of resources um, to make those resources uh, uh, available at a regional level, if not at a local level. Uh, and train those uh, workforce. Uh, that's the most important thing, even if we have the whole system in place, but we don't have a trained workforce to act on those, um, the outcome or even the surveillance um, indicators, it's of no use. So training and, and uh, expanding that trained workforce to act on this, uh, the responses from uh, outcome from the digital surveillance is most important. Thank, Thank you, you very yeah, much. Thank so you very much. And I agree about the training. Yeah, go ahead, please. No, thank you. That's that's my point. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I agree with the, the specific uh, I mean uh, comment on highlight about the trained workforce. And uh, uh, everyone would appreciate that ICMR is actually running a very good program in field epidemiology, which has created uh, several cohorts of well trained, I would say. I mean, very highly trained uh, human resources, which is now available for to the country. So uh, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you very much for your time. And it's indeed an honor and a privilege to be a member of this eminent panel. Uh, I think uh, what I understood from this poll, online poll now, and then we have uh, audience questions. Uh, so I would appreciate if you could stay a little while more with us so that we can uh, answer some of the audience questions. So over to Shrikant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Habib. So we will have four questions and 90 seconds will be provided for each question. So here comes your first poll. Please tell me if you can, if you are not able to see it. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. 
in case you want to add any other option you can add in the comment box below the poll questions Uh, so time is up. I'm ending the poll. Uh, so in this, we can see that most of the participants have voted for governance and leadership. And also uh, all the options have been considered to be included in the public health surveillance as an important component. Uh, so let's go on to the next question. Uh, so starting the next question, uh, you will be given one minute for the same and uh, uh, the question is launched. Can you see it? Yep. 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 I would request all participants to give responses. I think you can ask the question, man. Oh, okay. So I'm ending the poll and sharing the results. Uh, so in this question, uh, majority of participants has considered a community-based surveillance um, uh, as sub-theme in surveillance to be considered important for including in health system resilience. And uh, um, participants have also voted for digital surveillance, laboratory and hospital-based surveillance, and few have voted also for genomic surveillance and even based surveillance. Thank you. And I will be proceeding to the next question.
Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm sharing the result, and uh, and uh, most of the participants have considered data privacy and security to be the biggest challenge of digital surveillance. Also, the second one biggest challenge is ensuring equitable data benefit from data sharing uh, in public health surveillance. Um, the use of resource intensive technologies and ambiguity on its non surveillance use were also considered by a few participants. Thank you, everyone, and. Uh, going forward to the next question uh, so it's a multiple choice question and you can opt for one response i'm launching the next question can you see it yes. Thank you everyone for uh, your responses. And uh, we have observed that only 67% participants are willing to contribute in disease surveillance team for GLC for HSR initiative. So we will work much harder to involve all the other participants also to this initiative. Thank you everyone and over to Dr. Habib. Thank you very much, Manas. I, I can just briefly share my thoughts around the questions that I've seen on the chat box. And I'm very happy that we have got very interesting questions from our fellow colleagues uh, and experts uh, who have been part of this discussion. So I understand that Manas or Shrikant will be putting up those questions on the PPT slide and will be sharing with us. But just to uh, share those questions that I found really interesting to our panelists, uh, one of the question, uh, I mean, is from Dr. Murthy. Uh, he is asking about the role of surveillance in real-time decision making at the district level. How can we facilitate this? Uh, there are other interesting questions from uh, Dr. Reddy, who wanted to know more about: uh, are, Can there be any specific legal framework or mechanisms wherein we can mandate private sector to share data? Uh, another part from him was about triangulation of the data through various sources. We had very interesting comment and suggestion from a colleague in Australia. Uh, which, uh, I think uh, 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 they suggested about uh, sensitivity and specificity of the surveillance system, specifically with regards to how we can combine both sensitive and surveillance system to arrive uh, arrive uh, at a, at a reasonable uh, and a more efficient system. So, uh, but uh, uh, what I would do is uh, uh, we have specific questions now on the slide for us. And I would try to read these questions and would appreciate if our panel members uh, can volunteer to answer these questions. So the first one question is from Dr. Sunil Kumar from Kathmandu Medical College. And he is asking about how can we promote injury surveillance in the developing countries? So is it directed to any one of us or anyone can answer? You're on mute, Dr. Oh, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> Dr. Shankar. So, I mean, there are generally specific questions directed to specific panelists, but I think this is a general open question. I think anyone can answer. Okay. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so I agree. Uh, so, like non-communicable diseases and injury and uh, surveillance for mental illness, there are uh, like the blind spot in the surveillance system increases with all these uh, different sort of entities. 
uh, different sort of diseases that uh, affect human condition. So uh, I think uh, uh, injury surveillance, uh, I think the Department of uh, Transportation and the police, uh, at least we have the baseline fatalities and non-fatal accidents. We have that to only reported, not the, and I think some insurance claims data for road traffic, uh, wound damage, things like that. Those are the other ways of tapping into injury surveillance system. But uh, the EMR, the emergency um, uh, uh, trauma centers, emergency rooms, they can also be another source. But as I said, that depends on the digitization, uh, the EHR, and how can we anonymously saw, and also the standard case definition of uh, how do we classify injuries, uh, intentional, unintentional, things like that. So those things need to be inculcated. And I think, uh, uh, medical, uh, it should be inculcated right from the medical education, uh, the importance of surveillance and how to contribute to that. So most of the uh, medical schools or colleges, they're focused mostly on clinical management and uh, they don't talk about prevention and very much less about surveillance and how they can contribute to the data of this thing. So those things we can improve upon. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting point about inculcating these things into medical education. Thank you. Next question, please. So another question is open to all panelists uh, about how can systems be augmented for facilitating decision making at the district level? Sure, uh, I would just maybe uh, go first. Yeah, this is yeah this is what uh, uh, I, I just mentioned some time back. If we um, today with, 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 with technology, you can easily, not easily, but you can develop tools for doing exactly what this question is asking, augmenting or uh, uh, facilitating decision-making at district level and local level. Uh, so so the, the COVAS, the Chromic simulator that I spoke about briefly, which is based on a mathematical model, uh, it is a user-friendly dashboard kind of thing which can be used at district level. You just enter into your, enter, enter the input data, and you will get an idea about whether there's a sudden increase, trends, et cetera, regarding the health condition that, that, you, that you're interested in. So yes, uh, there are ways to do it. There are tools that could be, could be uh, developed. And of course, a second factor that, uh, that, would, you know, uh, that would be needed is adequate training and capacity building of the district level and sub-district level officials to use these kind of tools and decision-making tools uh, for their own uh, benefit. Thank you, Doctor. I thank you very much. Yeah. For yeah. 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 On. Yeah. Yeah. I tend to disagree a little bit with uh, with with uh, Sudipto saying that we need a mathematical modeling or other augmented uh, thing at the local level. The most important thing is to to have a, when we are talking about a dashboard, having that sort of digital surveillance system where. People every day morning when they're logging in into their system, they can see the dashboard with the disease incidents and how it's traveling and its trajectory. Just even understanding the line graph, that would give a lot great uh, understanding of disease strain and whether it was progressing towards disease outbreak. We don't probably need a big mathematical modeling to understand those or even those concepts are quite irrelevant at that those district level or the regional level. I think the simple tools are uh, quite important, which probably at the moment we are failing to make those available uh, at our local level. That's that's my um, say at this point. Can and, I just, yeah. so, can so I just, just chip in? Uh, can I just chip in? I understand what Dr. Akhtar you are saying and what Dr. Roy was saying. I think what Dr. Roy alluded to was the same concept that you are alluding. I think he was talking about the back end of the technology and what you're exactly. talking about front end. So my understanding is you are talking about visual representation and he's talking about the back end software systems, which actually provides you those kinds of predictive analytics. So I think you are talking, both of you are talking about the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you are speaking more from the visual representation perspective, he's speaking more from the technology perspective. Uh, is yeah. that what you want meant to say, Dr. Roy? Yes, exactly. I think that's what I wanted to carry. But thanks. Thank you very much. Next question, please. So this is specifically for Dr. Akhtar. Uh, uh, I think it's a long question. Why is that Australia decided to handle the pandemic differently? Which is better? 
especially about changing and could Australia be encountering another? So yeah, over to Dr. Akhtar. Uh, that's a big question, certainly. Uh, why Australia decided differently and we can like uh, handle it differently. So we know the outcome, what it is when we close our border. Um, of course, it's, we have an impressive health infrastructure, but having just an accessible and developed health infrastructure doesn't uh, make um, things foolproof. And particularly with COVID, we have seen that there are countries like in European countries like France, Germany, uh, UK, they, they have got all developed health infrastructure, but they couldn't cope with the initial uh, COVID uh, pandemics when it began. While the whole of the country, uh, whole of the world was grappling with with the case numbers, um, particularly going hard and strong and closing the border helped help Australia to develop that system within uh, within the country, developing the health infrastructure that is needed to deal with all those cases, rolling out the vaccination strategy when it was, and also uh, developing local strategy, working with the different community marginalized community and working on all different sectors. You talk about private hospitals, you talk about mental health facilities, you talk about um, uh, um, disability care homes, aged care facilities. So that, that gave us some time and, we, and, and buy in to, to develop and work with them and develop individual strategies, um, place-based strategies to, to, roll, to deal with, 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 the, with the responses uh, with the COVID. Uh, that's one thing. Um, the other thing which is better, natural immunity acquired or combination of both is quite different to say. I'm not an immunologist to answer this question, but I can say it, it depends what we are dealing with, particularly with COVID. It's hard to say. Um, we have seen uh, we, and we are seeing multiple uh, reinfections, even those who, who already have previous infections in alpha, alpha wave, delta wave, and again, having Omicron with uh, twice or thrice, uh, as well as um, uh, those who are fully vaccinated. And, and if you consider vaccines, then Australia is, is, is a pioneer. Almost nine, more than 95, 97% of population have double vaxxed and all in, in when you consider three doses. So that's also around 78%. So in spite of fully vaccinated, you can say, um, having a graded of hard immunity, we are still seeing that infection. But the advantage is that uh, those infections are quite mild and it's um, we are not seeing the impact that you are supposed to. Uh, the hospitals are not overwhelmed. Even if the hospital admissions that's ha happening, those who are mainly um, either unvaccinated or partially vaccinated or those who are uh, quite elderly in their 80s and 90s and have multiple comorbidities, uh, even if they are fully vaccinated, um, they, they are, we are still uh, seeing some of the admissions, hospital admissions, but not a huge deal, uh, amount of death compared to the admission and the cases. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Uh, well, this is open to, I think, all panelists, and it is specifically about uh, lack of financial resources in keeping our surveillance functional. Uh, what do you suggest all private hospitals and labs be under compulsory regulation in view of pandemic? I think that's, uh, I mean, Dr. Rai would be the right person to answer from the regulatory perspective. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm the right person. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, yeah, there has been, obviously, there has been talks, there have been debates about you know, compulsory reporting, or other compulsory regulations during pandemic times. And there are certain laws also, but very basic rudimentary laws. However, it's still, as I said, it's still uh, being debated, not, in a, not just at our level, at, the, at the, you know, higher levels also. So, I mean, it's, it's really difficult. There are pros and cons of for, for, for both sides. So, I'm not sure how, I mean, uh, it, it, if we can come up with one statement regarding regarding this this question. Absolutely, I agree. I think at the, in, in any case, in an event of a natural disaster, uh, Disaster Management Act is already invoked. So when the act is invoked, it automatically provides a specific, uh, I would say, a regulatory framework of what can be done and what cannot be done and who is reporting to whom and how the system should perform. And that's what uh, Dr. Roy also alluded to and he mentioned about uh, implementation of a vast laboratory network in the initial phases. So yeah, I think it, it varies from 
situation to situation. But I mean, if somebody wants to know more about the specific legal systems, I think we can always look at the Disaster Management Act. Yeah. So this. Yeah. Yeah. Can I? Uh, so. Sure, sure, sure. Please go ahead. Okay. I think Dr. Akhtar also wanted to talk. You go ahead. You go ahead okay. first. Yeah. So basically, yeah, I want to also contribute to this. So one thing we have to realize is uh, uh, private hospitals, it's not that they're not willing to share the data or anything. It's basically, it's very cumbersome to share the data. So we have to bring down the friction cost of sharing data. And I think digital technology is helpful. If you can find a consent manager, if you can find an anonymizer, and if you can at the back end integrate. So why is AMR data? One of the reasons is AMR data, they're using uh, different uh, IT systems, et cetera, in private sector. And it's very difficult to do this thing. So I think ABDM is bringing that sort of standards. And if this can be made anonymized and shared. And I think the other thing that private sector is also afraid of is uh, whether if they can show okay, so many tests they did in this hospital, they're revealing some sort of trade secret or something. So how do we mitigate those sort of uh, fears in the private sector? So I think there is a willingness. Uh, we work with extensively in under somebody's work with private sector. They're willing to share data, but they want to know how the data will be used, how it will be useful for them, and how it will be useful for the this thing. So I think uh, regulation is one which can be applicable in emergency, et cetera. But I think if we can start involving private sector during the lean phase, that when there is no emergency, and have them on board, then it will become so for like even in a Delta wave, we couldn't even estimate the number of ICU beds which were empty, et cetera. So then the dash, some districts, et cetera, created the dashboard and some uh, uh, hospitals were willing to share, at least the government uh, uh, fixed beds that they had, they're willing to share that data. So things will evolve, I think, but uh, the thing is, uh, as I said in the end of the session that, we should not forget the lessons or the mistakes we made and then all what lessons we can learn. And I also, the first question I want to touch upon, financial resources. Uh, yeah, financial resources are needed, but more than that, uh, a willingness to adopt science uh, because US had a lot of uh, resources. Uh, let's not, uh, but uh, their response was not so good. So we should, uh, not financial resources can only take you to that extent. Uh, like, for example, the Telangana and other states, they had all the resources, but the testing didn't happen. So let's not uh, only blame financial resources for lack of uh, willingness to have a scientific approach to respond to the pandemic. And uh, another thing about financial resources was when the pandemic hit, there was a lot of advertisements for hiring epidemiologists and uh, uh, this thing in uh, district level. Suddenly, everyone realized they, they need epidemiologists. But if you see their salary, it was like 30,000, 65,000. And the qualification they expected was post MBBS, they should have done a public health degree and this thing. So in that aspect, I would definitely agree that financial resources would have played. So public health is still getting neglected. It is still getting the hard end of the stick when it comes to clinical versus preventive. So if you see the salary structures between clinicals and this thing, you will realize that uh, public health doesn't get its due. So I think uh, some resources are needed, but that should not be the constraint to have a good response. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are running short of time. I think we are left with only now one minute. And I think we have very interesting questions. And I think panelists are also interested in answering those questions. But unfortunately, because of lack of time, we might have to stop here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, each one of you, for sharing your expertise, for sharing your time. And it was indeed a great honor and a privilege to be with you on this panel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, over to Shrikant. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, all the eminent panelists, Dr. Manjunath, Dr. Joy, and Dr. Akhtar. And thank you, Dr. Habib Hassan, for conducting such a wonderful uh, discussion. I would like to hand it over to Dr. Uma for uh, for the next proceedings, please. Uh, I'll go back to my one minute video for our, uh, you know, for posterity's sake and for all of us to have a view of each of us. 
because we can't be present in the same room right now. Thank you, Shivani, for doing the honors. And I have the honorable task of uh, saying that we had great takeaways from the session that we all know. Um, we had people all the way from Australia and India. So we got perspectives which we would never have got. While uh, some of the takeaways are that they were well taken care of till Omicron changed it and Australia. Modeling for COVID is something that we started in India. The simulator is still coming up and may be handled across. Uh, we had labs, which are 3,389 labs, 14 of them, 1,400 of them in the, private, uh, in the public sector. The reporting systems and the case notifications for TV exist and can definitely be replicated as we go forward. What will the baseline be? And without a baseline, how far are we? Will airborne diseases and disease surveillance take a different look as the tools uh, are developed to interpret the same? Will the collaboratives between institutions like Covaxin be another way forward? And of course, focus for the GLC being, we will be driven by the local needs as we go forward there will be a hybrid model that will come up. What is ideal? Is there something that's ideal? Let's remember the mistakes we made and learn from them. The specific steps for advocacy will definitely emerge as we take this forward. And it will be at, you know, taken forward to each of those countries that are participating with this. Do not forget the mistakes and learn from them again was a reiteration of it. A willingness to adopt science and how can we make that happen? Yes, these are some of only some of the pearls of wisdoms that we had over the last hour that we had this deliberation of. Dr. Habib, Dr. Hussain, Dr. Rao, and Dr. Shankar. Thank you for this brilliant interaction. We will come back in another five minutes so that uh, we take forward the final session, another very interesting session that will come out with. Thank you for staying with us and thank you for being part of this. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much.
It's a privilege to bring back all of you again to the final session for this afternoon on global health architecture and governance for resilience. Whoever thought to an, a little more than two years ago, we were actually going to change everything that the way we did, including the meetings where we have people all the way stand from the US and all the far, way far into the East. Dr. Srinivas Tata from the Far East. So I'm going to make this very brief and uh, introduce our session present presenter, Dr. Krishna Reddy first, a practicing senior cardiologist and the regional director for Access Health, the president for In Order. Uh, Dr. Reddy co-founded Care Hospitals in 1997 a chain of tertiary hospitals in six states across India and was the country's CEO from 2006 to 13. He has founded many enterprises, uh, the backbone of them being quality and affordable health care, Relicis in 1998 and realizing the first make in India with Dr. KPJ Kalam, then the chief of DRDO in creating this indigenous technology panel. At, Dr. At Access Health International from 2018, he leads the health system strengthening efforts in South Asia. Welcome, Dr. Reddy. The session moderator for this afternoon is somebody who's going to give us more to understanding of healthcare than just healthcare. So I would invite Dr. Srinivas Tata, Director of Social Development Division of UNESCO. Dr. Tata is a physician by qualification with experience in social policy, public health, finance and taxation, and program management. As a part of his current role, Dr. Tata works on social protection, gender equality, social inclusion of persons with disability, youth, migrants, amongst others. 16 years, of experience working just with the United Nations. For that, he was in India and he used to work with the policy in India. Dr. Joanne Langerburner, a global health expert in social health and insurance in Indonesia, 
has worked in health financing for over 35 years and experiences and advises governments on health systems reform, including the US government for health reforms. Dr. Langeberner, major areas of expertise, including health financing, strategic purchasing, and universal health coverage. Privilege of having Ms. Preeti Khan, the former health secretary, Ministry of Health and Family Health Welfare, Government of India. Ms. Sudan is a retired bureaucrat who was the key strategist in shaping the country's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Prior to her health secretary position, she was with the Department of Food, Public Distribution, Ministry of Consumer Affairs. Uh, she has been a key functioning in the plan functionary in the planning and implementation of the Aishman Bharat Yojana. Welcome, Ms. Sudar. Dr. Hank Beckton. Dr. Beckton has a track record of 32 years in international public health leadership and health reforms management. For 24 years of the 32 years, Dr. Beckton worked with the WHO, the World Health Organization, predominantly in Asia. He was also seconded to African governments while working with the Dutch government. Professor Sten Wermuth, Professor and Dean of the Public Health at Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Wermuth is a pediatrician and infectious disease epidemiologist and focused on diseases of low and middle income countries. The thrust of his research focused on health access and adolescent and sexual reproductive health and rights and prevention of HIV transmission amongst general and key populations, including mother to child. With an illustrious panelist, or panelist such as this, I will hand over the session to Dr. Krishna Reddy to take forward this very, very conclusive but very interesting session on global health. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Uma, uh, for the short and brief introduction of all the panelists. Uh, that saves time for uh, Dr. Tata, actually, for introducing the panelists. Uh, uh, yeah, what we started, I think, today, uh, the journey uh, with the overarching theme of uh, trying to understand what is resilience. I think that started with the definition of resilience and different opinions of experts and the practitioners, uh, what each one of them understand resilience. Uh, then there was a question of uh, how do we actually assess whether the systems that we live in or the systems that we govern are actually strong and resilient to face a health shock. I think uh, that was the overarching frameworks that were discussed in the first session. And uh, in the framework, uh, in the context of uh, the six building blocks of the health system, and also the non-health systems, which are equally important as for the health of people is concerned. And those building blocks in the context of four phases of health shock, in terms of the pre prevention, the preparedness, the response and the recovery. Uh, I think this grid of uh, six building blocks the non-health systems and the four phases of uh, the health shock. Uh, so the whole learning journey under this theme, I think will slowly meander along these lines. And uh, in the one of the polls, I think uh, after the first session, uh, majority polled uh, one of the critical building block in terms of the resilience, especially during the COVID pandemic was the leadership and the governance. Uh, this session actually kickstarts this thematic work on the leadership and the governance. And uh, more specifically, it starts with the global governance. Then in the subsequent sessions in the future, uh, we will come to the national governance, the state or the provincial governance, the district governance, and the village or the ward governance. So I think uh, just the top-down governance may not be adequate unless the governance is dissected and discussed uh, to the level of the local governance, including the community involvement. I think uh, 
Uh, this will be the, the journey of uh, the debate and the discussions of all aspects of the government, because it's talked about a lot in the health systems context, but uh, we don't have clarity what actually we mean by the governance of health systems. Uh, so the effort, I think, in this uh, panel discussion and subsequent discussions will be to understand the governance. Uh, Stuti, can I uh, have the slides? So uh, briefly, I will just wanted to uh, place the context for the today's discussion uh, and uh, then leave it to the uh, distinguished panelists representing the various aspects of the global and their member states. I mean. Jack comes from the World Bank experience. Uh, Hank comes from the WHO experience. Uh, Mitsudan Sudan comes from the national governance experience. And Sten comes from uh, the global health think tank experience and the academic experience, especially the vaccines and the other uh, elements of uh, the global equity distribution. And Dr. Tata brings in the non-health the social elements of uh, the health system. So I think it's a, one of the, the, the uh, best representative panel uh, today we have. Uh, can I have the next slide? So the, placing the context. Uh, <clears throat> so I think uh, why it, it, it has become important to relook at the global governance is that uh, whether we want it or not, uh, now the world is uh, interconnected and interdependent. I mean, what separates the nations uh, in terms of the information, the communication, the knowledge transfer, the microbes, the climate, uh, even the currency in the era of cryptocurrency. I think that the, all these things do, are not respecting the borders. So the borders are artificial only to contain the people and the, and the goods, but everything else, I think uh, there are borders do not matter. So in this context of interconnected and interdependent world, uh, governance plays an important role and is, it becomes essential and uh, to put into place a good governance system for the world to function in a harmonized, coordinated and collaborative way. And the nations that constitute our world are diverse in their culture, economies, environment, religion, governance systems. So to govern this disparate uh, uh, nations, you need a much more robust architecture of the governance system. I mean, that is what I think the panel uh, is looking at the discussing in that. Uh, the United Nations and its various agencies that came after the World War II were established with a specific purpose at that point of time. But at each crisis point, whether it's the economic crisis or the political crisis or the climate crisis or epidemic crisis, uh, there was a disruption and there was a questioning of the existing status quo of the governance systems. And that is how I think that the reforms process has started. And ineffectiveness of the current governance architecture is increasingly becoming evident in the face of global economic, geopolitical, climate, and health crisis. I think we have convergence of all these things as a case examples today. Uh, we have Sri Lanka collapsing as a, as a collateral damage. Uh, we have Ukraine war, uh, which has a, a tremendous global impact in terms of uh, uh, increasing poverty and inflation. And we have the ongoing the COVID pandemic and uprising monkeypox. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, and the climate, uh, the heat waves uh, un unheard of in the Europe and the US. So we have, I think, a convergence of the various crises uh, for the governance system to wake up and redesign the architecture. I think this is the context for the discussion that we have today. Uh, next slide. So I, I think the COVID has laid the fault lines where in the global health architecture and its governance system. Uh, the singular low, role of leadership and the governance systems in pandemic response has been brought to uh, even the countries which scored highest in the, their security index. They had the highest, one of the highest mortalities uh, in terms of the pandemic outcome, uh, suggesting that uh, it is not the existing uh, evaluation systems may not be adequate to assess how the systems respond. And various, I think, introspections are happening from the global health context, uh, the independent panel uh, of which uh, Ms. Sudan was one of the members, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, uh, uh, again, uh, it has given its reports, uh, independent reports commissioned by G20, reports commissioned by G7, 
Uh, there is a, a intense activity in trying to learn uh, where we things went wrong and where the fault lines are and how to fix this broken architecture. I think this is the, the basis for uh, a, a flurry of discussions and the debates across the global uh, the ecosystem. And uh, given this ecosystem and what was simple uh, UN and its agencies, now the actors playing in the global health architecture. Uh, as for the 2015 study by Chatham House, it was about uh, approximately 240 actors could be counted who matter for the global health architecture. There are state actors and the non-state actors. Uh, so there is a growing role of uh, non-state actors on par with the state actors. And given the global architecture, I mean, since there is no mandate to steward or regulate, uh, these non-state actors as well. Uh, there is only a coordination collaboration between the various actors in the global health architecture. So this is, I think, the broadly uh, uh, the context that I wanted to mention. I, I, I'm not going into uh, some of the recommendations of the independent panel uh, that were mentioned, and also the recommendations given by the GPMB uh, leadership, uh, uh, what we learned and what reforms that has to happen, especially in the WHO governance, uh, whether the governance system has to be elevated to the UN level because the whole of governance and the whole of systems uh, uh, articulation. Uh, and also uh, the recent report by the Director General of WHO, uh, some of these uh, literature has been shared, actually put up in the knowledge portal as well. Uh, again, the consultation taken by the Director General with the member nations and the deliberations of the 75th Assembly of the W Health uh, Assembly. Uh, I think there is a rich uh, dialogue going on and uh, this is an area where uh, we have a lot to learn, the students of global health and the students of health systems, we have a lot to learn. Uh, and the learnings from the global architecture, they become relevant also to the national architecture because we don't see the similar introspection are taking place at the national levels or the state levels uh, systems for them to learn and fix the architecture and the governance systems. Uh, with this brief introduction, I think to the discussion, uh, not taking much time further, uh, I hand over uh, the subsequent deliberations to Dr. Tata. Uh, I think he carries excellent credentials to steer this discussion. Uh, with all the uh, uh, the most reputed panelists in the house. Uh, over to you, Dr. Tata. Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy, for your very kind words. And I thank Dr. Uma for making my life uh, really easier for, by, making, by introducing a very distinguished panel. Indeed, we do have a very distinguished panel today. And I thank you, Dr. Reddy, for laying the foundation uh, by providing the background for this uh, very important panel discussion. Very rarely have I seen such a wonderfully complimentary panel. And so I, I really look forward, uh, therefore, to having a very fruitful discussion. You know, this session is perhaps the most overarching of these sessions. Session one covered health system resilience assessment framework. Session two covered the disease surveillance systems for resilience. This is kind of providing you the eagle's eye view. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll perhaps look at the forest rather than count the trees. In this session, we'll try to get a flavor of uh, and explore the reasons why many feel there's a need for a new global health architecture, which are based upon the principles of equity and good governance. What, how do we strengthen WHO's finances? How do we empower it? to better administer uh, your, you know, you know, the international health regulations. We, of course, like Dr. Reddy uh, suggested, will perhaps draw upon the independent panel report through our questions and discussions. And perhaps we will explore some of the issues which are now foremost in the mind of those engaged in public health, especially this, uh, this body of practitioners here. Maybe we'll look at the issue of universal health care. What do we mean by resilience of health systems? Uh, and uh, what are the steps? Where did we go wrong? I mean, it's not necessarily wrong. Where, where could we do better in terms of improving international cooperation to deal with health emergencies? I, I think we are very far away from ending this pandemic, but we also have to look at preventing further pandemics. And remember, 
that the global and the national are very closely linked. I mean, we can talk about the global health infra, um, architecture, but we need to complement it with a good national, functional, and extremely well-funded health systems. So I, I think uh, we have this wonderfully complementary panel, and we're going to start off this panel discussion uh, perhaps with uh, two rounds of questions. I, I plan to go with uh, one question for each uh, panelist with about four to five minutes for them to answer, then go back again with a second round of questions before we open up to questions from the floor and perhaps really have an interactive discussion. The topic is such that I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions, a lot of viewpoints. So without much ado, uh, I'd like to come to our first panelist today, who is Dr. Langan Bruner. Uh, is he online, sir? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Dr. Tata, I'm on. Yes, yes, yes. Dr. Langan Bruner, I can see you uh, on the screen. So my question to you, Dr. Langan Bruner, is we know based that the COVID-19 pandemic had perhaps shown that countries with perhaps well-funded health systems and with universal health care were perhaps able to deal better with the pandemic. Though there are, like you said, no one-to-one -one correlations, even well-funded uh, health systems struggle. But generally, I think health systems which were strong were able to deal with the pandemic better. We know that our region, especially Asia Pacific, and many countries, developing countries, do not spend enough on health. But I will, do you think that this pandemic has created more urgency and a commitment to spend more on health? So where, based on your experience, how can we seize this momentum? And who are the stakeholders that we can work with if we are to increase investments to strengthen health system and implement universal health care? Over to you, Mr. Langendroner, Dr. Langendroner, sorry. Uh, Jack, you are mute, uh, muted. You're done mute. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tata, and uh, thank you very much for asking me to join the panel today. Um, I don't want to be too uh, provocative, at least at the start, but uh, I, you know, for the short term, let me just say that I am not particularly optimistic. Oh, right. Really, we have the great uh, economic and fiscal downturn from the pandemic that may be abating, that's good. But for many countries, I think we're now dealing with supply shocks. We're dealing yeah. with inflation, uh, as well as, um, uh, as well as, uh, as well as uh, some very minimal recoveries that we're seeing across countries. And then there's the impending food crisis. And yes. India, for example, has wisely stopped its uh, wheat exports. So, from here, it looks as if there may be less fiscal space for health uh, due to low and not just uh, nominal GDP growth uh, and little or no growth in fiscal capacity. By fiscal capacity, I mean the percentage of GDP going into any government's treasury. So I think now the, the Ministry of Finance is, is now um, not only facing a fiscal capacity uh, challenge, but they're also facing other ministries which you know, have taken cuts during the, the COVID crisis, ministries like education and infrastructure, and they're gonna want their fair share, at least in the near term, in terms of their budgets. And uh, we have to remember that uh, you know, when you do talk to the Minister of Health, uh, uh, she or he has other competing priorities, not just health. So he, has, uh, he or she has a number of different cabinet ministers coming in and saying, what about me? Uh, we can do the job. We've been taking the hit for the last couple of years. And I think this is one of the challenges that all of us in the health sector uh, have to reckon with. So, but I think at the same time, uh, Dr. Tato, there are things that can be done. Uh, first and foremost, let's increase the pro-health taxes on sugary beverages, on tobacco, and so on. And I think this will bring in revenues. It will also improve health. Uh, my WHO colleagues have estimated that in low and middle income countries, increasing prices by 20% would decrease use of tobacco by 4 to 16%, alcohol by 13%, uh, sugary beverages uh, consumption by about 24%. It's, you know, to me, it's pretty straightforward. Higher revenues and better health at the same time. Second thing I think we can do is to use our existing policy levers 
to push more relative, uh, a greater percentage of the funding to more cost-effective services such as primary health care. So uh, all of us have uh, been looking for many years now at ways to strengthen and push more money into more cost-effective services at the primary health care level. This is our opportunity, I think. Third thing I think we can do is prioritize the benefits package. We, we need to protect the poor, but for the non-poor, let's look for opportunities uh, such as maybe modest co-pays, or let's cut out some of the questionable procedures and outdated protocols. And uh, it was mentioned that I'm actually working now in Indonesia, and I have told the, the ministries and the leadership in Indonesia that their benefit package might even be too rich too rich at this point for, for the, the fiscal constraints they're facing. And then I think the fourth and last point that I'll make would be to look for ways to improve efficiency in the healthcare system. So again, WHO a few years back has said that most healthcare systems face um, a fat, if you will, or inefficiencies in their pharmaceuticals and their hospital care and their lack of task shifting. Uh, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of their spending could be more efficient and at the same time not harm outcomes. So I think this is our this is really our opportunity at this point uh, as we as we sort of face these uh, these fiscal challenges. Uh, so overall, then business as usual, I, I I wouldn't expect to see bigger budgets or higher premiums uh, for health insurance in lower middle income countries or even in OECD countries. Uh, and these, uh, these, uh, these things may not be realistic in the short term, uh, you know, let's say two or three years. So again, don't wanna to be too provocative, don't wanna to be too pessimistic getting started here, but at the same time, that's, that's the way uh, I think uh, things look at this point. Over to you, Dr. Tata. Thank you very much, Dr. Langenbrunner for giving us a reality check. You know, it is, I think you've, your, your incisive answer, and I could see uh, Ms. Sudan uh, having maybe gone through a period as, as a secretary health, asking for funds from the, from the finance ministry, kind of smiling. And I, I realized that, that these, I think it's, it's a question of doing more with less, unfortunately, at this present time. And thank you for outlining some very, very clear options. But I will come back to you in, as part of our second round in terms of how we can look at health systems. But Ms. Sudan, my next question is for you. Having led the health ministry at the, cent at the central level, ma'am, can you tell us, and it's a very big question for you to answer, but I can't think of someone more capable of answering this. What are the main challenges that India faced in dealing with the pandemic and in Delhi? So can you talk about the two or three highest priority actions that you would take if you had to improve the functioning of the health system in India, knowing that we are in a, in a federal system, a lot of it is handled by the state governments, but over to you, ma'am, for your wisdom. You're muted, ma'am. I think you need to take. Yeah, greetings yeah. from India and thank you, Dr. Tata, uh, for giving me the chance. Uh, quickly, uh, let me uh, spell out some challenges that we faced in India, and I'm sure these challenges are quite universal uh, and specific also for India in some ways, because we are 1.38 billion population, very diverse, with a very varying uh, health infrastructure. And uh, there are some uh, states, and, or, or I would say provinces in India, which are better off in terms of infra. So what did we do? So you had to actually, in a crisis situation, think of out-of-box solutions. For example, we converted railway coaches uh, into COVID care centers. And, you know, because our railways, railway lines are pretty well uh, spread throughout the country. So those are the kinds of things we did. We repurposed our infrastructure. And uh, therefore, I want to highlight that solutions have to be contextual. We should never forget that. So there is no one cure for everything that uh, you know, we may say academically. Practically, solutions have to be contextual. That's one. Next is, as you also hinted, that health is a state subject. So what did we do? We invoked the Epidemic Diseases Act, 
we invoked the Disaster Management Act. Why did we do that? First was to ensure compliance. And secondly, so that the states could draw out of what is called the State Disaster Response Fund. So that the fund crunch, because there, then you see you, no questions asked, no processes uh, involved. The access of funds for the states is easy, quick, but of course, the purpose of the funds was outlined. So we had challenges, but we did think of out-of-box solutions. Then another main challenge was that the supply constraint of essential uh, commodities, because we didn't have the PPEs, the cloth was ex imported from China for the, uh, for the N95 mask, the respirator uh, was also imported. We imported the ventilators. So what do we do? Therefore, in any situation and for, uh, of crisis, and I would say for a, a lesson, great lesson from uh, this pandemic that we learned was private, public private partnership can do wonders. And you know, government can be a great facilitator. So today we are exporting PPEs, uh, ventilators and masks. I'm talking of N95 masks. So from acute scarcity, there we are. It was a very difficult journey, but everybody in the country got together. Then, you know, there are this, this low health seeking behavior and gender undertones also. You must, uh, we must realize that. Uh, now, how do we tell people, you know, 1.38 billion people that, well, there's a pandemic, you have to observe COVID appropriate behavior. What do we do? So, uh, and many people laughed at us. You know, we uh, had this, uh, what we call janta curfew, or I would say voluntary curfew uh, in uh, on March 22nd, 2020, wherein we clapped with gratitude for the doctors, for the frontline workers. It was again a contextual thing led by the prime minister himself. That one day actually told the whole country that here is a pandemic, you have to observe COVID appropriate behavior. And this is, was one way of uh, sort of coming together. So this was actually whole of government, whole of society approach, and it was led from the very top. So that's, that's, that's what in a nutshell I'd like to say, not taking too much time. And if you would ask me, what are the priority actions? I would say strengthen primary care. You see, uh, uh, USA spends 18% of its GDP on health, it's basically in secondary and tertiary sectors. What happened? You know what happened in US, you've seen the suffering, you saw what happened in New York. And, and the states were left to do what they would like to do. Here we had one approach. So therefore, you know, a clear uh, centralized policy approach, but contextual practical implementation at the provinces level, at the state level is, is the key. And primary health care is very, very important. When I talk about primary health care, I want to stress that we have to bring wellness into health now. So that is why uh, you see our health, we are institutionalizing this concept by health through health and wellness centers with promotive, preventive, multi-sectoral approach to health. So you see the, there's a Fit India movement, there's an Eat Right India movement. So communitization of health is very, very important. Of course, we have to strengthen uh, infrastructure. And here, Dr. Hank Begdom, my former colleague, he was country head of uh, India in of WHO. It, is, it was pre-pandemic also. We used to have discussions on how infectious disease blocks should be there. And Dr. Hank, you would be happy to know, of course, we are calling them critical care blocks now, but a lot of funding for these um, you know, creating this kind of a critical care infrastructure with hospital uh, in hospital blocks in all our districts, having more than 0.5 million population. So this infra strengthening is, is, is also very important. Then, of course, strengthening surveillance under one health approach, because as you would know that WHO has listed out 10 infectious diseases that could become epidemic. Out of that, six are zoonotic. So therefore, one health approach to surveillance and then funding of research, 
and collaborative research. And I'm not talking only about the national level collaboration. I'm talking about international collaboration. Yes. yes. And I also said, of course, communitization of healthcare. Uh, you know, um, having social audits of yes, yes. Um, uh, um, interventions of government. So that okay. also we have guidelines. I think I've taken up more time than allotted. So I'll stop here and give others a chance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sudhan. You, you, you said a lot of things which are music to the ears of many. I could see a lot of nods around. I think you kind of uh, sounded the same notes as, uh, as uh, Dr. Langenbrunner before you, and you also highlighted several specific aspects and the talk about the critical care infrastructure, primary health care, all I think resonated with a lot of, uh, a lot of our audience. But we will come back to you, ma'am, maybe with, with a broader question on this issue, but allow me to then move on to Dr. Henk Beckedem, as, uh, as you alluded, who's been a WHO representative to two of the biggest, most populous countries, both China and India. So I met him when he was uh, a WR in China. So you are uniquely placed, uh, Dr. Beckedem, also having done a regional role, to tell us what, in your view, are the gaps and deficiencies in the global health architecture that hindered a more effective response to this pandemic. Can you highlight the most critical gaps that need to be plugged in this regard? Over to you, Dr. Beckham. Thank you so much, Dr. Tata. And, and lovely also to see others like Dr. Krista uh, Reddy, Dr. Piri Sudan, of course, Jack Langenbrunner and Stan Furman. Um, it, it's really a pleasure to, to be over here. If you look at the global health architect, that's, these are big questions, but at the end, I think it needs also to come down to a few things. A global health architecture needs to be agile. If you deal with infectious diseases, things go always a little bit different than you think, but you need to be able to respond. I would like to reflect on that. Inequities, in a, in global, health, a global health architecture needs to deal with inequities. And if it doesn't, then I think we need to challenge it from how to make it better also in the future. And these are all part of what you already introduced, part of good governance. Now, if you look at the, the, the health architecture, you, you can look at the international organization, but of course, the countries. The countries remain, of course, the key in the response. But countries can benefit and should also be able to benefit from what other countries are doing. So that's the part where sharing also is extremely, in begin, is extremely important. One of my assistant director general, when I was dealing with the SARS in China, he said, when you new, deal with a new infectious disease, it is like uh, sailing uh, while building the ship. You're in the middle of that ocean, but you don't even know how your ship is looking like. But then, but therefore, I think you need to learn. And learning, you need also not to do within the countries, but also globally, because that's the way you can be, you are able to deal with new challenges better. So that, that, that's a part what's important. Now, if you look at international organization, and I was very happy that, uh, that Ms. Priti Sudan already was mentioning it, the one help. We need really to see if we start more relying on one health. And I later on would like to come back to it because the one health immediately looks at the health of animals. It looks at the health of humans and it looks at the health of the environment. Now, uh, since the new infectious diseases, 80% of them are coming from animals, then immediately you have a far much more important component there is the prevention part. And that's an issue which I think needs a lot more global attention and, and that is something which I would like to raise now. Then you need to look at the tools who are available. What tools do we have at this very moment? Now, we have the international health regulation. As you know, WHO, we have only three legal documents. One is our constitution, uh, one is the framework of control for tobacco, and then an international health regulation. Now, this has been reviewed, and there are a few things where we really need to start looking at, can't we do it a bit better? It's a document which is mainly at a voluntary basis. While at the beginning, if there's an outbreak, perhaps there should be a better ability to start sharing information earlier. In an outbreak, a week is a long, long time. If there are delays like that one, that is very important that we need to look into that one. So the tools, the international health regulation needs to look at it. Then we look, to look at the supply chain. I think Mr. Sudan, you were already mentioning in the beginning, not only in India, but of course in India for sure too. We had difficulty with the supply chain, but it was everywhere the PPE, the diagnostics, uh, that was in the early phase before we started. And but then later on, the medicines and the, 
and the vaccines right. became right. came issues. Now we have a TRIPS agreement where at a certain moment when there are emergencies that we can uh, deal with in a different way that money should not become a reason that people would not have access to it. But also we think we two issues, of course, with the supply chain. One is the production itself. And the second thing is the distribution. And on, on the, the distribution by the trips could perhaps play a, a bigger role, but it's also true on the production part. And I can still remember that I one time had an, a, a workshop and I started talking about perhaps it is important that we start promoting that everybody should get a flu shot because at the moment that we have a bigger demand for flu shots than at the moment that we need it for a new disease and we have an, a new vaccine needed, then the global capacity will be bigger. I think we need to look into some of these issues. Now, the country capacities are important. And I think the, 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 this is an area where under international health regulation, there are some uh, core capacities identified who are important. And I think we need to start looking into how bet, better to do this. So in very short, if, I think in the global health architecture, we need to remain agile. We need to be able to deal with inequities. We need to look, start looking now at the tools uh, the supply chains already mentioned, but there's one thing which I would like to mention uh, before closing, although it looks far away from the global health architecture, but it's very important. There is no disease one without the communities. We need to make sure that we stay in touch with the communities. They need to be informed in the beginning and they have all the role. And I think what Ms. Sudan was just mentioning, when you need to get the population along, but because a pandemic, is it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. You need to make sure that throughout you take them along. It's about vaccines, hesitancy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so these are some of the issues which I would like to share with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Beckerdom. You surely did not disappoint. I think you highlighted a number of issues kind of picking up from uh, Ms. Sudan's response. But your response, especially on the importance of access to vaccines, the issue of trips, really helped us segue very nicely onto Dr. Sten Verman. Uh, uh, Dr. Verman, you've done a lot of work on vaccines. And uh, so my question is a broad one coming on vaccines. Uh, to your mind, what are the main reasons for the large inequities in access to vaccines and therapeutics that many developing countries experienced and that continue even till date? And uh, I know it's a big question, but your five minutes, the Herculean task to fit us and give us your response on this. Over to you, Mr. Dr. Berman. Thank you, Dr. Tata. Uh, this is a good question. It nests within the context of what the prior speakers have been discussing uh, with the excellent introduction from Dr. Reddy. Um, first of all, let's talk about research. Um, the National Institutes of Health uh, at, in the United States has a budget of $45 billion a year, $45 billion a year. The ICMR budget is slightly more than half a billion dollars a year, somewhat over 2000 crore. Um, so that's a difference uh, that nearly 90 fold difference in terms of uh, resources invested. And as you know, India is um, uh, four times the size of the US, three times, three and a half, four times roughly the size of the US in terms of population. So one can um, say that the US in, is investing $250 for every $1 that the, that the Indians are if you control for population. Now, maybe that's not a fair uh, comparison, but let's just say that the absolute difference is almost 90 fold. So where will discovery emerge in biotechnology arenas, possibly where the investments are the greatest? We also have a substantial um, scientific brain drain. Um, folks are coming from the south to the north where the uh, research opportunities are um, more robust and salaries are better. I actually think it's more the um, research opportunities than it is the salaries. When I talk to scientists who were uh, born and, um, and professionally raised in India, China, Africa, else elsewhere, uh, they really are looking for their best 
career opportunity, not so much the, the, the salary. But the point is that there's a vast gulf between the nations of the world in terms of investment in biomedical research. Second of all, we have the um, private sector. Keep in mind that governments don't manufacture vaccines or pharmaceutical products and bring them to market. Only the private sector does that. Um, and uh, there are no uh, infrastructures in my country, in the United States, to manufacture vaccines uh, or drugs. Uh, there is a famous um, laboratory in Swiftwater, Pennsylvania, uh, which is thought by many to be manufacturing um, vaccines for the U.S. military, because the U.S. military uses some exotic arboviral vaccines to anticipate potential conflict in, 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 uh, around the world that are not in common use for travelers or uh, Americans for their own sake. So there's a special lab. Even that is not a government lab. It's simply on contract to a private uh, uh, um, um, vaccine manufacturer. It's simply a contract lab. So there are no substantive labs. Uh, that are government run. So naturally, these are being um, spearheaded by market forces. Where am I going to make money as a CEO of a pharmaceutical company or as a, um, a CEO of a biologics company, uh, such as a vaccine company? I'm likely to make my money in the high income nations of the world where I can establish a substantial profit margin. Now, before we despair, let me uh, draw from my own experience. I was working in Africa on the PEPFAR initiative, the United States President's Plan for Emergency Relief uh, for AIDS. And uh, PEPFAR was at the time and still is the largest global health initiative in, in world history dwarfing, uh, you know, smallpox eradication, we managed for $300 million global investment. PEPFAR alone has spent over $90 billion now to control HIV worldwide. And um, it was hemorrhaging vast amounts of money on high cost Western drugs. But when Indian manufacturers, Cipla, Ranbaxi and others, um, came up with generic drugs whose quality matched that of the high cost Western manufactured drugs, the US government was caught in a bind because they were telling people, we can't uh, violate international protocols for uh, patent protections. Uh, on the other hand, they could treat eight, nine, 10 people with AIDS drugs for the price of one uh, yeah. dose uh, from the Western world. And the FDA and the US government pivoted and made some very uh, strategic decisions to say, okay, well, we're not going to allow these, to, these drugs to be sold at low cost in the United States. That will threaten the hegemony of US manufacturers and European manufacturers. We don't want that. But we're going to have a special approval process through the FDA for these Indian drugs uh, so that we can buy them and use them in Africa. And that's what we've been doing for uh, the better part of um, uh, 15, 16 years. So there may be ways for the developing world to um, take on uh, vaccine manufacturing and have it supported by uh, international, manufact uh, international donor agencies. And my time is up and I pass the pass the microphone. Thank you. No, no, Dr. Verman, I think you really outlined some very critical issues, including how research is funded and the fact about research to uh, ac academia, private sector linkages. But you really, uh, I would love to draw upon those ideas of yours for the next round in terms of the solutions as we seek solutions. But it, uh, allow me now to pass on to uh, Dr. Langenbrunner for the second round. Dr. Langenbrunner, 
We did. I mean, you gave us a reality check. You made it clear, you know, what can we do under these constrained circumstances? There's a lot we can do, including the fact that, okay, look, maybe new sources of, uh, of funds are not available, but maybe we've got to cull more. Maybe we've got to reprioritize, make some hard decisions. But now, can I ask you, I mean, one big, one of the panels here focus on resilient health systems. You know, the big thing flying around, we need to have resilience. You know, we need to have search capacity. What do you mean? What, what would be, uh, what is the common understanding of resilient health systems? Are they supposed to be more adaptable and agile? Are they supposed to be, you know, can they take on sudden surges in demand? And how can we then reform health system to make them more resilient? Over to you, Jack. Thank you again, Dr. Tata. I, uh, you know, these words, uh, resilience and agility, I actually started by looking, looking them up in the dictionary. And uh, I found uh, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness. Agility, I found ability to move quickly and easily. And so I see this from a health systems perspective. I'm a health systems person. I see this as similar to the concepts of uh, responsiveness and innovation. And I have to say that, you know, many countries where I've worked, uh, low and middle income countries, uh, whether they be in the Middle East or in uh, Eastern Europe or in Asia, uh, you know, they often exhibit sort of what I call, would call big bang reforms, big bang reforms uh, across the board, but then they do little or nothing for some period after that. Let's say, three years or five years or 10 years, you know, they're sort of stuck. Well, we, we've done the reform, that's it. But, you know, we really need a process in place in, in any country to continually update and improve, you know, uh, you know, models such as the early uh, UK NHS model or the classic uh, Soviet Samashko model. These were, these were great models in their time, but they failed to really evolve with changes in disease burden, uh, then there were other issues of being uh, of being uh, of not being uh, patient centric. So uh, I think uh, I think there's some good historic lessons that way. Uh, and I, I would really like to see um, see us in in various countries uh, building and governing a system that is continually dynamic and innovative. And let me just you know let me just give you some examples that. That I, that I see as sort of good examples, obvious examples, simple examples, but nevertheless, they give you a sense. Uh, technology assessment, technology assessment and the benefits package. How can we update for new cost-effective technologies? And how can we remove the outdated procedures? Whether you're in a low-income country or the United States, we have uh, a high percentage of procedures that are outdated that need to be taken off the benefit package and uh, more money uh, put into things that are coming for, forth uh, that are both, um, that, that improve both quality and are cost effective. Uh, a second example, assess the annual changes in financing across income groups and geographic areas, you know, just as a first proxy of equity. It, you know, we, can we do that? Can we get the data just to start looking at what's going on in terms of equity? Uh, and then drill down to the extent that we need to do that. Um, a third simple example, let's do ongoing piloting of new organizational models, of new human resource policies, of new financing systems. Um, you know, when I look at Europe, while I'm a, an American, while I look at Europe and I look at primary care over the last 20 years, I see big transitions from, you know, sort of solo practices, GP solo practices to larger uh, primary healthcare organizations in, in a number of countries. Uh, and that's very interesting. And uh, that's not something that happens overnight. It often uh, uh, requires some piloting and some, and some, uh, and some uh, evolution. But that can't just come, you know, all of a sudden uh, that we decide that we're going to move to a different organizational model. Uh, another simple example, corporatized public hospitals. Public hospitals that are both flexible and responsive to incentives, the new management models to improve efficiency and improve quality. Um, another example, using your national health accounts, using your national health accounts to look at funding for primary care, looking at the balance with prevention, public health and surveillance. 
Uh, and I, I have to say that what I've seen, I've worked in a number of countries uh, looking for ways to, to achieve universal health insurance, and they've been using social health insurance as the way to do that. But I have to say, and I don't know of any study that exists, but I have to say that my own observation is that sometimes these uh, social health insurance models are moving more money to curative services and maybe pushing out some, some of the money that we need for yep. traditional right. health, for surveillance, uh, prevention, and so on. So, so I, I, I worry about that. I've even talked to my colleagues in Geneva at WHO about this. They have similar observations, but we don't have any good empirical studies on this so far. And finally, good monitoring and evaluation. Okay, we had a, we had a first session expert, Dr. Irene, that nicely pointed out uh, the need to quickly and precisely hone in on the impacts. You know, she discussed the measuring some functions, how to measure the functions. Uh, I like the Kerala examples, the Kerala India examples that were, were very good in terms of um, good and timely surveillance for being responsive. So I think there's some good uh, examples on the table that we can, that we can look to. Uh, with that, Dr. Tata, back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Langenbrunner, for being so comprehensive and point-wise. It's almost like I see uh, so many takeaways from your answer. So thank you so much. Uh, allow me to now move on to Ms. Sudan. Ms. Sudan, let me go on to a question that I've been dying to ask. You've been a member of the Independent Panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response. We recently had uh, uh, Dr. Helen Clark speak about it during our commission session in the United Nations. Can I ask, uh, being from India, what, are, what is the value, do you think, we're discussing this international convention on pandemic preparedness. So what value do you think that convention can bring to countries? And uh, what, how, can, how can a country like India benefit from such a convention? Well, before I go to that question, I'd like to begin with the writer. Uh, yeah. You see, uh, this convention is still in discussion. Yes. And yes, are we just tinkering the global health uh, governance or are we transforming it? I think we all have been speaking about a uh, overall. So yeah, yeah. Um, um, and, and there is now an intergovernmental negotiating body, which yes. is actually going through some 131 recommendations by four uh, review groups, including ours. Yes. And also looking at IHR uh, uh, amendments. Yes. and will submit its report to the WHA in 2024. We've already had two uh, years into uh, this pandemic. We can't wait for so much. So first thing is, well, yes, a convention is needed. Yes, a treaty is needed. Global governance needs uh, a transformation and it has to be timely. We can't go uh, get ourselves you know, wrapped up in processes, number one. And uh, now coming to your uh, question, well, if there is a agreement, then timely alert is, is, uh, is what our con the country would be looking at. Human to human transmission was declared by WHO on May, in January 20, uh, 20, uh, on January 24th, 2020, after you see cases from Wuhan had already spread to Thailand, South Korea, Taiwan, and USA. So if it had been done earlier, maybe, you know, borders would have been sealed or screening would have been done and so much of agony would have been um, uh, uh, avoided. So WHO also had its hands tied. So they also need, you know, more power, more independent funding and countries will definitely benefit from a timely alert, number one. Then, of course, coordinated one health platform for surveillance, we will definitely benefit from that. Then um, we would also, uh, you know, uh, agree on collaborative research, where uh, you know the private sector is willing to not only give up their, um, I would say, IPRs, but also technology transfer. You must have been reading about the W proceedings yes. yes. now. You know, uh, if IPR waiver without technology transfer means nothing. Nothing. So, so therefore, I think we all need to come together because these are global goods. We can't go on a profit motive for this. And next is, of course, if it comes through, then um, also country will benefit from, I would say, 
a contextual te technical support as we have been benefiting from WHO uh, through our country heads. Uh, so therefore, uh, collaborative research addressing inequity, because yeah. you see, um, uh, and uh, uh, you need more uh, widespread hubs. For example, hubs are coming up now in Africa and all, but you see, is there demand, is there capacity? Um, so therefore you need to have um, thought out um, uh, you see policy for addressing inequity. Then uh, also I would uh, say that, uh, you know, we have been talking about, uh, uh, you know, WHO or any other, uh, I would say, international multilateral governance in place, they need to decentralize decision making. For example, the regional heads also, they do not have their hands are tied, they need uh, in a, um, you know, a go ahead from the headquarters. So that should also be sort of, uh, you know, decentralization of decision making so that help can come in a timely manner. So we right. will definitely benefit. And uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful that since all of us are talking about it, all these issues will be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Susan. In fact, your response nicely again links up, and that's why I was talking about the complementarity of this panel, to my question to Dr. Beckadam. Dr. Beckadam, just drawing upon what Ms. Susan said, how can we strengthen WHO further in the context of today's health challenges? What are the steps that could be taken in the short and medium term? We know that the convention, maybe there'll be big time reform coming, but what do you think are the low hanging fruit, if there are any? Yeah, in terms of strengthening that virtue. No, th th thank you so much, Dr. Tata. You might know that we worked, uh, Ms. Sudan and myself, we worked very close together. And I believe me or not, she mentioned seven points and five were on my list. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, Sorry about that. <laughs> and, and we have not communicated about this. But let, let, let me still uh, to, to try to address it and perhaps somewhere even to go uh, a little bit more expanding it. Um, yes, I, I think there are definitely some roles, and, and in our pre-discussion, we also had some thinking about how WHO could also improve their performance. I would go one step further from what Ms. Sudan just was mentioning about, I really think that more of the support should go to countries. Countries, they understand better the context, they understand better from what, what is there, but then, so, so it, it, it's the decision making, but also some of the capacities and resources should go there from where there's the biggest need, because it is for sure to the inequities and capacities, they were there. And of course, this was nothing new, but for sure, I think with the pandemic, uh, it, it, it was showing so clearly and it was very painful to see as if we were not aware of this. So that, that, that's one part. The IHR is, as a tool is now very voluntary, but here is of course the difficulty when you work in the UN agencies, you always have to give it all the member states. And True. if a few don't come along, it's sometimes very difficult. And I strongly believe, and I was also part of the International Health Regulation Review, although travel advisories, they are very hesitant about it, but if you do it, you do it in the beginning. If you really know that a virus is only in one country or in one continent, then is the time to do something. But the international health regulations made it actually more difficult to come for WHO to that point of view. I had open discussion that time also with the India government, and I more or less said, this is the difficulty. If you make decisions, do it now. And I was very proud of India that they made very early on these kind of decisions. But the tool needs therefore to improve in order to be helpful globally, because we talk about a global issue. On the surveillance part as well, and is that the surveillance part, it varies a lot. Uh, and you need to be far much more connected. We need to start standardizing the, the standardizing the reporting and also the automatism in, in all with all respect, but this is very difficult sometimes for member states but because they feel that information needs to be cleared and it needs to be certain processes. So that's a difficulty, but I think it should be definitely on the table to start discussing those issues that it can be more timely because indeed a one day difference is, is, in, is, is a long time in, in a pandemic, et cetera. So the, 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 these, these are some of the more detailed ones, but, but having said so, you can also build upon the things uh, that one is doing. I think what's in India have happening, 
at the integrated health information platform, and Mr. Dam was one of the drivers of this one. I think there's an excellent platform that has some of these uh, nearly, re nearly real-time web-based reporting. Uh, another issue that, that was also coming up in some of the literature is that if it is a pandemic, it should perhaps earlier go to a higher level because the impact we all now understand. I have since 2003, after the SARS, in my presentations, I always had from an economic point of view, how important it is to start investing in this core capacity in the IHR. And of course, people always smiled and my presentation I updated and with the Ebola, I could say that the three countries that 12% of GDP went down, et cetera. But, but these are some of the things that perhaps at a higher level than WHO, uh, meaning health, uh, than ministries, it's important. It's a multi-sectoral part and that perhaps also in the, within the UN, it needs to go uh, one uh, edge up. On the one health, I really would like to emphasize a little bit. I have, was fortunately, I was asked by the, the Dutch government to be a chair of an expert of zoonosis, zoonosis expert. And we came up with a document and there's so much to be done that you can prevent things to happen. If you look at the international trade of animals, if you look at certain customs of having animals coming in a market all together uh, and then start having a party in the market and thereafter they go to different places, um, the, 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 although these live markets are very important in the Asian culture, but believe it or not, in China, at least I got my time as a WHO representative, we had an agreement with Beijing as a city, Shanghai as a city, that there were no live markets anymore. Admittedly, if you go on your bike 50 kilometers, then it was still happening. But these are, these are issues that you can also try to prevent. And, and the zoonosis part can only be done at the international level, um, et, et cetera. Then I think the other part was also mentioned from, indeed, we need to go from patents to looking at um, the vaccines and, and other medicine during pandemic as global public goods. We need to yes. have a pre-agreement yeah. that this can be done faster. And it, not only the patents, it's also about technology transfer. Because that was yes. one of the bottlenecks I didn't even mention in my first round from the technology transfer was at a certain moment, uh, or, yeah, as big as an impediment, as uh, impediment uh, yes. than than the patents. Now, yes. these things I think we need to be there as WHO chosen an organization. But I like as well in one Lancet article where at a certain moment say the scientific pillar needs to be strengthened. That's about yes. the yes. learning and the sharing. And yes. that's it's nice that Jack Langbrenner is also there. We work together on an observatory in the in the Asian region where the World Bank and more academic institutions could start working together. Like in, in Europe, the European Observatory has a very strong base. We need yes. to get the academia also involved and get all the, the brains helping to think about it. And prevention is the best. I think there should be a lot of emphasis. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckettum. And as usual, you've provided me a great segue to move to Dr. Werman because you picked up on the whole issue of uh, um, you know, uh, global public goods, treating vaccines, medicines, you know, therapeutics, diagnostics of global public goods. Dr. Werman, can you tell us, I mean, you already started talking about these regional manufacturing, public-private partnerships. What are the good examples and how can we, what are the few areas that you can identify how we can, how international cooperation, including all these modalities can help in ensuring better access to vaccines and therapeutics. Thank you again, Dr. Tata. Um, there are several models. Um, the simplest model might be national programs that are subsidized by local and uh, donor governments. Uh, the most dramatic recent example is the so-called um, uh, project Warp Speed in the United States, in which over $10 billion were provided to uh, vaccine manufacturers to accelerate um, final uh, development and production of COVID vaccines. Um, I wish I could say this was uh, orchestrated for global good, but let's be honest, it was orchestrated to vaccinate Americans. And um, the, the um, investment was quite direct, money actually given to private companies to facilitate their final clinical trials and their um, licensure and to ramp up production. 
Now, this uh, might be better understood in the context of a pandemic emergency, is not likely to be business as usual. But these subsidies are going on all over the world. Uh, I'm, do not, I'm not privy to their magnitude, but Sinopharm and Sinov Sinovac in China have been substantially assisted by the Chinese government for production of the inactivated COVID-19 vaccine products. There has been support from the British government to AstraZeneca for the Oxford, so-called Oxford vaccine. And um, there may very well be support that I'm unaware of for the inactivated and mRNA vaccines that are being produced in India and the new mRNA product in Singapore. So um, that, again, might be a pandemic response uh, that is designed to get a vaccine as quickly as possible and as many arms as possible within one's political constituency. Um, but that is part of why um, uh, well over 3 billion people have now been vaccinated with the Sinopharm and Sinovac Chinese inactivated products because they were produced uh, quickly and cheaply with substantial uh, national um, subsidies. Uh, a second example is national programs, but not funded by by governments, but by the private sector. And uh, there's a very interesting example, and I've given you a New York Times uh, article in your chat to read it at your leisure. But uh, Johnson & Johnson um, licensed its COVID product, uh, COVID vaccine product to Aspen Pharmacare in South Africa. But um, one of the principal um, ways that vaccines are being being provided to Africa is through donations, either um, from pharma companies themselves uh, or through donor country purchases. And let's take Gavi. Um, they are providing um, millions, tens of millions of vaccines uh, to Africa, uh, but J and J is donating them directly from their Western manufacturing operations. Gavi doesn't have the resource to actually purchase the vaccine from an African vaccine manufacturer. And hence the vaccine manufacturer in Africa doesn't have anybody buying their products. So this is uh, the global mischief that is being generated, I think, by uh, relatively uncoordinated responses. Um, a third example is multilateral partnerships with public-private uh, arrangements. And uh, there are um, a number of such examples, the COVAX, COVID-19 Vaccine Global Alliance, COVAX, yeah. along with WHO uh, and other Agave and other partners, that's one example. And just taking Africa for a moment, and I know this is a very uh, Asia-centric meeting, but I think Africa is where the need is the greatest and being um, uh, most neglected. Taking Africa, for, for example, the Africa Union has the African Vaccine Acquisition Trust. That sounds like a good idea to me. But then uh, uh, there is also the COVID-19 technology access pool, which is a partnership focused on Africa. And then there is a the fourth example, the partnership for African vaccine manufacturers launched by the Africa Union and, and in partnership with the Africa CDC. Do we really need four of these? Uh, why wasn't why wasn't uh, the first one, the COVAX, good enough? So you can see that there is, when we get into the, the arena of multilateral partnerships uh, and looking for private partner collaboration, it seems that many agencies feel, well, we need to do this. No, 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 we need to do this. No, 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 we need to do this. So um, it's a shame that WHO isn't able to provide one platform for these sorts of things that everybody else buys into. Others want their own platforms and it becomes 
less coordinated and less coherent. Now, I don't mean to sound so pessimistic. I want to end on an optimistic note. Just the fact that the Chinese are producing billions of products and actually through partnerships, getting, in the, getting them into the arms of people who need them around the world is extraordinary. Just the fact that it's Indian um, uh, uh, HIV um, antiretroviral drugs that are driving the global uh, treatment response to the AIDS pandemic. Just the fact that we actually have a manufacturer in South Africa producing the J&J &J vaccine with the highest caliber of good manufacturing process uh, uh, being approved by everybody who goes and reviews this, whether, whether it's international review agencies or the uh, South African, the excellent South African uh, regulatory body. So there is movement in this arena and there is leadership coming from countries like uh, China, India, South Africa. And there is promise that we can do much better uh, going forward. And I'll just end by reminding people that when we have our um, measles vaccines, our, our tetanus vaccines, any number of the expanded program immunization vaccines, we are now manufacturing a preponderance of those vaccines in low and middle income countries. And that's why they cost a nickel each, a nickel being five US cents. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Berman. Uh, I think you've been, you kind of put the icing on the cake for us in terms of the information that you have provided and the suggestions that you have made in which, uh, and also pointed out what are the drawbacks. But having said that, uh, uh, we've come to the end of our two rounds of questions. So we have, we might have overshot our time a bit, a bit, but I think it was worth it to listen to this wonderful conversation. So uh, may I ask uh, if there are any questions, maybe Anu was so, do you have anything on the slide that, uh, that I could use in order to ask questions specifically? While Anu is pulling uh, the question, I can pull up uh, a question that came over here. Uh, I mean, there is a question that comes, how can we build better accountability of national governments to the international community? And uh, how can agencies like WHO be strengthened to play a more effective role? We keep, it's a question that WHO and the UN keep, how, why can't you hold countries accountable? But you know, it is about why uh, comparing the, the, you know, charging the secretariat but not doing enough to hold countries accountable. But we know how countries are as a group, right? It is, I mean, the UN is a group of countries and they always assert the sovereign right. But maybe, uh, Dr. Hank, maybe you can attempt answering the question, how difficult or easy is this, holding countries accountable to an international agency? Yeah, uh, th 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 thank you very much. Uh, I think this, this, this is, of course, an, uh, a challenge. And I think the issue that we have already been discussing and it came from various panel members is from a, a way of making it more easy is creating the tools. And it can include, for instance, like the international health regulation in which there is a bit more uh, that, that the mandate of WHO would be strengthened to really follow up. Now, often what WHO needs to do when there is something, you need to ask countries if they agree with uh, what you would like to make uh, public, et cetera. And these are something which I think needs to be either way looked at, uh, I think you call it now a convention or a treaty and in the international health regulation. So the tools needs also to say. The other part which is true, which has not been mentioned, yet, has been partly mentioned, it is also true, if you look at WHO funding, the funding is 20% is guaranteed that WHO has. And that has also been discussed in the IPPR, uh, and Ms. Sudan is also a mem member of, that this, this funding, which is only 20% guarantee, makes us quite vulnerable. And it makes us also quite weak in, in, in areas because then we rely for 80% on the funding, voluntary funding. And if a country says from, 
I would like only us to work on this aspect, while perhaps globally the need, need might be in some other area that is sometimes very difficult for WHO because if we're not funded to do some work, that, that makes it also makes us very vulnerable to be driven by or to be guided then by the money instead of by the needs. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much, Dr. Henk. I think you addressed the question uh, straight on. Uh, I think this question by Pavati Ramakrishnan perhaps is addressed to uh, Ms. Sudan. It's talking about how the existing educational system, and I would assume the medical education system or, or the general one, can be adapted or modified so that government-run private medical colleges can rework their curriculum, MBBS, MD curriculum, to increase the number of seats, uh, especially for community medicine and for family health physicians. And we know that the whole thing about folk, we, we strengthened public health recently, but maybe you'd like to take this question, Dr. Susan, and maybe Dr. Longenbrun after that, based on. So I would answer it this way, that, you know, it's a question of demand and supply. Uh, till now, the medical education was moving towards specialization, away from community medicine, family health physicians, and general medicine. But I think this pandemic is a wake up call. You do need uh, more doctors in community medicine, in public health, in family health. So uh, I'm sure that in uh, the uh, near future, we will see that shift. That's one question. Next is that there has been a lot of thought on reworking the uh, MBBS and all uh, curriculum. There has been. And the new uh, medical council that we have, they have uh, set up, you know, um, a committees to look at it. And also there was this government run um, governing body, which actually made compulsory um, district uh, internship, district hospital internship of uh, the uh, MD students, for example, so that you know hands on experience dealing with doctors sorry dealing with patients at the in the rural areas is also something that uh, the specialists should actually uh, learn and experience so that uh, they have incentive to work in those areas and also that actually uh, it is a win win situation thank you jack would you have any additional insights from experience in other countries uh, Dr. Tata, I would say there's a short-term issue and a longer-term issue. So, you know, the longer-term issue is all about education and market signals. You know, when young students go into college, they not only think about the clinical aspects, but they also think about the, the rewards, both uh, monetary rewards and status, you know, and, and uh, so if you go to Japan, the primary care physician in a rural community makes as much or more as the surgeon in Tokyo. So things like that are very important. Uh, but I would say in the short term, and of course, I don't think we can think in this, uh, in this uh, uh, colloquium about uh, what we can do 15 years out. Let's think about the short term. And certainly we can think about some of the retraining programs. I saw, I have seen some very successful retraining programs in Eastern Europe. Um, and also that uh, those retraining programs were coupled with new financial incentives. And if you take the, the case of Estonia, they moved them to capitation, but at the same time, they carved out capitation so that maybe 40 or 45% of that capitation payment was fee for service. Why did they do that? They did that to actually monitor the claims and make sure that physicians were providing the services that they should at the primary care level because they weren't quite sure. And, uh, you know, so they were retraining uh, Soviet level, Soviet uh, time, uh, Soviet era physicians who had di very different protocols and very different outlooks on things. So I, I do think there are successful models and, um, I think India is uh, is quite interested in this topic and can move forward quickly. Over. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, there is one more question from Michael Borowitz. It said, uh, "It says, uh, look, 
there are some countries which had strong primary healthcare system, which did not seem to help much in COVID. So what aspects of primary healthcare are needed for a resilient system? Then what should be prioritized in function as a big expansion of coverage is unlikely. I mean, drawing upon what Jack Longenbrunner said and others. Maybe we'll use this question as uh, we'll go to all the uh, panelists just to provide the one minute view on this. Maybe we start with Jack, go on to Ms. Susan, then Hank, and then Dr. Werman. Over to you, Jack, first. Well, thank you, Dr. Tata. I'm a great uh, student of Dr. Michael Borowitz, so I, I really appreciate his comment, and uh, it's, it's a very good comment. Now, I would say in the UK, you know, one of the interesting things for me was that the UK public sector looked to the private sector to help them, and they did quite a lot of contracting with the private sector. So, um, you know, that was a very interesting aspect for me. Maybe that's what agility is all about when you have both a public and a private sector that you can go to the private sector and they can respond very, very quickly. So I don't know much about why PHC did not help that much, but maybe that's something that could be looked at. We have wonderful research institutions in, uh, in the UK, and maybe that's something that uh, LSE or the uh, LHSTM could uh, could look at and come back as a very important uh, uh, lesson for us. Um, what should be prioritized as funding will be relatively flat. Um, yeah, I think big expansion is unlikely. I think we need to keep moving on coverage, but at the same time, when we bring in people uh, in the system, Make sure that uh, we have the right benefit package and we we have the the right in place to 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 push money into, into the correct levels of care i think i've used my one minute thank, thank you. you thank you miss sudan uh, maybe i'll or maybe i'll go to uh, dr beckadam and then come back to miss sudan maybe she'll be back by then um yeah oh, oh, my microphone so yeah, thank you so much um i i think Arguably, the PHC structure for the UK was at least very helpful for the vaccination. The UK was in the vaccination after Israel. I think they were the quickest on top of, of, of things. And I think that structure has helped. So, but, but it's also very clear, it is not only about this. It's also about leadership. It's about also other things. The certain mother herd immunity thought might have been a little bit too strong uh, from the UK perspective, and that, that became, uh, I think, a big, big challenge, um, etc. But should be prioritized, and I think this is not only for the UK. Uh, I, when I was working on the zoonosis part for Dutch government, I had to look for um, the, the, the risk factors for zoonosis in uh, the Netherlands, but also globally. And I thought I could make a, a, a great point that the Netherlands was not investing enough in public health. The Netherlands spends more than 10% of its GDP on health, but yeah. only half a percent goes to, um, to public health. And I thought it was a specific issue for uh, the Netherlands. When I got data from the OECD and, and from the EU, e EU, it was more or less the same. I think the balance increase, uh, people like ourselves always like to increase in the health sector because we see it as an investment, but for sure the balance might be, uh, needs to yes. improve. We need, at a certain moment, believe more in the prevention part. Uh, and, and it is from, and I just give one very simple example. You guys might have been following as well that the, the, the bird flu at this very moment, the high pathogenic avian influenza, is very big globally. Uh, it, it's in Europe, it's now even to the US. We have made a very simple recommendation, and we say that poultry farms should not be next to a water. Yeah. Guess what? Yeah. If you look in Europe where the first one came, were all the poultry farms who were next to a water. Now, these kind of things, they are prevention. You can prevent to have a poultry farm next to a water. So these, there's so many opportunities that you also can prevent the spread. And I, I, the, I've, I've, we've got a very long report with 74 recommendations, and I will spare you that. But there are, there are uh, you need to get a balance around public health and prevention first. Thank you. Ms. Sudan, just last words from you before I move on to Dr. Werman. So uh, you see, um, the UK system is, is, is great. I think we need to acknowledge that. But maybe as Dr. Hank said, the promotive preventive part also needs to be plugged in. And if we are in India, we are trying to do that. And whole of 
society whole of government approach also needs to be uh, there to strengthen uh, a resilient system that's one next is what should be prioritized i think it has to be a balance it has to be uh, an emphasis on primary health care strengthening our uh, critical care centers strengthening surveillance mm -hmm. strengthening research so we, we, we though, even though it may be fla relatively flat in future but we will need to balance all yes. the priorities that's the way to go yes last words for you dr stenwerman what would be your thank you uh, i think it's a little early to uh condemn the uk for not having done better <laughs> for example um the uh, mortality analyses are still uh, extant and um and um what i've seen to date is the uk did much better in preventing deaths than the us did and that may be because of better management of chronic diseases because of the uh, national health system that removes many of the um, uh, equity barriers uh, from access to care. For example, in the United States, we have many uninsured people. We have many underinsured people. We have many people who do not have ready uh, transportation to health care. We have uh, uh, physician and nursing shortages in areas uh, th that are um, lower income. Uh, most of these are blunted uh, by the British public health system, which has a much more deliberate um, uh, deployment of uh, medical staff to remote rural areas, et cetera. And um, management of chronic diseases by nearly all accounts is superior in the UK than in the US. And we all know how chronic diseases uh, and obesity are uh, risk factors for yes. adverse outcomes for COVID. So I think it's a little bit, you know, to say right. that the public, the public health care, the primary health care system in Britain didn't help much with COVID, I think is probably wrong. And I think that we're probably going to find this out as uh, new uh, operations research uh, analyses emerge. Uh, I also think the point that Hank made about uh, the fact that you can be funding healthcare and it looks very favorable, uh, but still neglecting public health is uh, an excellent one. And finally, uh, keep in mind that UK, US, Brazil, and selected other countries had the absolutely worst political leadership. The response by national leaders Johnson, Trump, Bolsonaro couldn't have been worse, literally misleading the citizens of their country as to what should be done, literally undermining the efforts of their primary care um, uh, 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 leaders and health leaders, uh, undermining their uh, ministers of health or secretaries of health and human services, as the case may be. So uh, there's a there's quite a, a, a medical historian's uh, yes. a, a challenge to really get to the bottom of how well did countries do? What were the elements uh, in their response that were most favorable? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berman. Indeed, I mean, during the course of this pandemic, heroes of this month have, have been the uh, failures in, in two year, two months time. It's been very unpredictable. You're right and your point is taken. So with that, we come to, I think we have run out of time of this for this very exciting panel discussion. And I hope all of you have enjoyed it, listening to it and contributing to it as much as I've had the honor of moderating it. I think we couldn't have asked for four more distinguished and more involved and more knowledgeable panelists. It was really a privilege to be moderating this panel. And Dr. Reddy, thank you so much for providing the wonderful, uh, uh, should I say, preamble to this uh, discussion. So over to Dr. Reddy or Dr. Uma, whoever is going to provide us with the closing remarks or the closing wrap up. Over to you, please. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Tata and uh, uh, all the distinguished panelists. Uh, uh, it was a wonderful, I think, uh, uh, listening to uh, also wisdom for most of these people experiential wisdom as well as theoretical wisdom. Uh, we will be, uh, I think, curating all these uh, knowledge that came out of this today's session. Uh, something touched on the political management of the governance, something touched on the technical management of the governance, and something touched upon the financing of the governance system. So I think 
but this will be, I think, uh, crystallized uh, uh, once we go through the entire recording and then bring out uh, some of the learnings from this session and then share uh, both with the participants as well as with the faculty. And this journey will continue, as I mentioned in the beginning, because this discussion actually raised some a lot of interesting questions which have to be pursued as a part of the discussion and learning. Uh, we hope that uh, uh, this collaborative learning will continue. Uh, with this brief, I think uh, uh, my personal thanks to all the participants. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. And uh, my one minute video, please, with everybody. Thank you, Shubhad. Thank you. Um, wrap up of a session of an afternoon of delight, of intellectual uh, understanding, the range of subjects, the range of practical knowledge and theoretical exposure is something that was a true treat that we had this afternoon. While I said we, what we started two and a half years ago as a pandemic, it was summed up to say that it was an opportunity for change. Higher budgets for health industry and health spend are unlikely. Solutions have to be contextual. Deal with inequities as much as you need to because that is here to stay. More support to countries where there are inequities in capacities is a must. Get in touch with the communities. They are the people that will tell you what's happening right at the bottom of the pyramid. Pandemic is a marathon. Can't be better said because so many industries have found change of the kind that they would have never expected and the disruption has been massive. Responsiveness and innovation are key and we had several examples to that. The big bang reforms die over time, but need to be updated and improved to be able to provide massive change that we so require. Prevent, not treat. And that came across several times. From patents to global public good, a hard one to digest, but will have to happen over time if we need to be able to have equities across the world. Leadership from China, India, South Africa shows promise. And yes, it does. Because there is the manufacturing hub that gives the LMIC countries to bring down the cost. The questions and answers are invaluable. The one health that's going to be a way forward is something that will leave us. The leadership and the governance, the political will for change are some of the other things that we have seen, discussed and heard from the experts through the evening. Dr. Reddy, Dr. Tata, Ms. Sudan, Dr. Beckerton, Dr. Langerberman and Dr. Wilmot's 10. It was indeed a privilege to have all of you this afternoon, evening. And I must say, for some, I have said afternoon and evening. I have forgotten to acknowledge that it's very early for Jack and for Sten. And it's really an honor to have you all wake up, wait, sit, and listen to us where we've had a comfortable time. Let us see how we can do better on time, but to meet the East and the West is a continuous challenge. And we definitely want to have all of you there as we go forward. Dr. Srinivas Tata, special thanks to you for making this session as interactive as it did. Thank you, good evening, good night, good morning, and have a wonderful day. <laughs>